These are the schools of the Ivy League. Brown University, Columbia University, Cornell University, Dartmouth College, Harvard University, University of Pennsylvania, Princeton University, Yale University. And this is the Ivy League football game of the week. This week, Yale meets Harvard at the Harvard Stadium, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a capacity crowd, an air of anticipation and excitement, it's Yale-Harvard. There are those, though, who would actually say the preparations for a Yale-Harvard game go all the way back to the first day of preseason practice in August. The records going into this 101st meeting actually are incidental because it is Yale-Harvard, the game. On the day before the game in Cambridge, there is a most uncommon picture that unfolds on the playing fields of Harvard. On this site, in the course of an afternoon, there will be played 30 different games in five sports. These games will include more than 500 students from 12 colleges of Yale and 13 houses at Harvard as they engage in battles from co-ed touch football to men's and women's soccer, tackle football and women's rugby, as well as the junior varsity and freshman football games. Some of the players will be talented and others not, but every house or college will be represented and will enter the fray with no less fervor than their varsity brothers. Alumni from both schools left their desks early for a look at the young men who will carry the colors for the next three years. The rewards here are friendship and camaraderie. And although there once was a cup for the Victoria School, it has been unfortunately misplaced. In junior varsity action, it was Harvard who defeated Yale. In freshman play, it was Yale 10, Harvard nothing. And flying in from Salt Lake City, Utah, to see their son Mike play quarterback for Yale, Mr. and Mrs. Curtin. Long before it is time, though, to tape ankles, put on the uniforms, and participate in the game, the gates will open. Cars of every kind and description, some of them classics, will be driven by some of the most famous names. We'll quickly fill the field surrounding Harvard Stadium. There are pregame luncheons and the most traditional of all, the Ivy League rituals, tailgating. Because this is Yale-Harvard, tailgating can take on an aura of elegance, even in a parking lot. Linen-covered tablecloths, tastefully adorned with flowers for the season. The menu might include anything from New England clam chowder, hors d'oeuvres to fillets, and so much more. Naturally, with appropriate beverages to ward off the chill. There is camaraderie that has transcended the years. A deep respect for each other and the two institutions involved. There will be those who will be hoarse from shouting during the game. And when it is over, the brothers and sisters of Yale and Harvard will lock and embrace with a hearty job well done. This is Yale-Harvard, what the game is all about. Well, hello, everybody. This is Dick Galliott at Harvard Stadium, and it is filling to capacity and just moments away from this exciting kickoff in this 101st rivalry between these two schools. And, of course, my sidekick during this telecast to bring us the assessment of what's going on during the field during the entire ball game, Upton Bell. Dick, Upton, thank you. Five and three overalls, but there is a difference. Yes, there is a difference. I think that Harvard, really, by grace of their ground game, is the superior team coming into the game today, even though Yale has won three out of their last four and come back in the last couple of minutes to win the game. The big problem with Harvard is, Dick, will Brian White be at full strength? My sources tell me that people say he is all right, but my sources tell me that the knee is still bothering him. So the key to Harvard today is not only their ground game, can Brian White run like he used to in the past, and can Yale's defense stop that vaunted offense? Well, that'll be the question. And then, of course, out here yesterday with his team running through the work end, well, workout was Yale head coach Carmen Coza. His team is supposed to be pretty hot of late. You're the team that's supposed to be on a roll. Would you agree with that? Well, I sure hope so. Uh, we've we've won five of our last six, and uh, we gave Penn a pretty good football game up until six minutes to go. And we've had to come from behind in three of our games, and, and last week was really something special. With one minute and 26 seconds, we came from behind to win. So this is a gutsy team, and they're playing awfully hard right now. You're playing for what would be the big three championship. That's the whole ball of wax right now. 
It really is. And, of course, the last two games mean so much to not only the players but the alumni and the student body and, and all, fr all the friends that are involved. And uh, uh, the last victory, of course, would, would really cap our season. It would be a great season for our young men. Number seven quarterback for Yale, Mike Curtin, the off-injured star here hitting his big tight end. Number 33, Andy Marwini, as he weaves his way down the sidelines against Dartmouth. In the Princeton game, Mr. Comeback, as he's known, Mike Curtin again lofting a pass into the end zone to their deep threat, number 82, Kevin Moriarty. The other part of their combination, and the only breakaway back for Yale, here on the toss, number 26, Ted McCauley reverses his field, cuts his way through a lot of bodies, and scampers 70 yards for a touchdown against Dartmouth. Well, those are the questions that Yale has to answer this day, uh, Upton, but there is a question that Harvard coach Joe Restick has, must be tired of answering by now that has been asked of him all week after that loss to Penn a week ago when he was I, I going think, for that, for that uh, league championship. I think it's uh, very quickly, it's their kicking game and is Brian White healthy, but particularly is their kicking game better than it was against Penn. If it is not, Yale will get good field position and Curtin has been doing the job. Harvard Joe Restick, as we said, when we approached him, Answer that question one more time. Can your team rebound from that loss to Penn a week ago now against Yale? Coach, the obvious question after the loss a week ago where you were going for the Ivy League title, how difficult was it to get the team ready for the game this week against Yale? That was our easy, easiest job, believe it or not. We got, came back. Monday had a light workout. Tuesday, Wednesday were super days for us. Carried right through the week, and I think we'll be ready. Uh, this is always a big game for both schools, and you want to go off on the right note, and uh, a win here carries you through the winter. All those things are important. Bragging rights. Bragging rights, and of course, recruiting rights. All the things that you have to get done over the, the uh, spring of the year and into the next season. We look at this game as a, the end of one season and the beginning of another, start of a new season. Number seven will lead Harvard in their new season against Yale, and the big question with Brian White is, as part of the Pony backfield, his injury going to be a factor today? He scores here, but will he score against Yale this afternoon? If he's not capable of running, number 14, Robert Santiago, the leading rusher for Harvard and also the leading rusher in the Ivy League, possesses the speed that no other back in this league has. And to round out their backfield, number 33, their workhorse. As he breaks tackles here and hurdles another man, he is the second leading rusher on Harvard and must be effective against the Yale defense today for Harvard to win. And the member of our crew who is certainly closest to the action all afternoon long is our man on the sidelines, Sean McDonough. Well, we apologize that we're not able to bring you Sean McDonough on the sidelines at this particular moment. We're back up here at the galley at Upton Bell. We're just a moment away from the opening kickoff of this 101st meeting between Yale and Harvard. Upton? Well, do you think the bulldog spiked his microphone? I mean, everybody's pulling tricks today, and everybody's waiting for MIT and a lot of other things to happen in this game. It is a tremendous traditional game. But there is a football game to be played, too, on top of the tradition. And Dick, you and I talked about it briefly in the opening. Can Harvard come back after a, a really a blowout at Penn? And can Yale continue on their winning streak of coming back in the last minute or so of each and every ball game they've played? Well, they went 98 yards in 91 seconds a week ago to beat Princeton. Harvard, on the other hand, has to be able to prove that they can regroup after the disappointing loss to the University of Pennsylvania a week ago in Philadelphia. And now... Down on the field, as you see, our officials for today's game, the referee Ronald Hoover and uh, his crew, meeting with the two captains for Harvard, number 88, well, we Steve started, Abbott, like and for 51, oh, for Yale, Martin Who's Martinson. Charlie Phillips is our back judge. Milt Holstead, our linesman. Dave Brody, our field judge. Jimmy Quirk, our umpire. Sir Cole Watts in the air. Heads, heads be called. It is heads. You have won the toss, you have the option for the first half or second half. First half They won, first half option, they will receive. Which goal will you defend? Right to defend this end, sir. Okay, white team, won and received. Harvard 
defend this goal. Good luck to you, fellas. Well, there you see, there you heard that Yale has won the toss, and there are the standings coming into the game. Penn sits on top, and they are against Cornell today. It would take a big upset by Cornell to knock them off. Harvard would have to beat Yale, and then there Harvard would share its third straight Ivy League championship. If Yale should beat Harvard, and then it would be a tie for second place with Harvard in the Ivy League standing. There he is, 20th year of coaching at Yale University, their winningest coach of all time at Yale, Carmen Coza. And you would have to say he's been through it many times, but each and every time he plays this game, he's got to be as nervous as anybody around. And, of course, today, with his team being underdog, Dickey said earlier in the week that he kind of liked the underdog role. He And he wasn't kidding when he says that. He likes to come up here to Harvard Stadium as the underdog, not the favorite, because at Yale Bowl, the favorite, when he has been, he has been defeated back there in New Haven. And there he is, the man in his 14th season, looking for his 78th win overall, Joe Restick. And there you see his record against Yale. And against Yale and Harvard Stadium, he is 2-4. and four. He hasn't done very well either. One, one other stat that might be kind of interesting on Harvard's part, they're back on natural grass today. Both they and Yale play on the natural grass. But particularly for Harvard, they haven't won a game on turf. They've lost five games in a row, including Penn last week. They just do not play that well on turf. But with this running game on the natural turf, now we'll find out how good they're going to be today, particularly against the two linebackers for Yale, and whether Brian White on this turf is going to be able to get his footing and how that knee reacts early. That's something that we're going to zero in on as we can as they move along early in this first quarter. Well, the two men who will go back there deep in white, in white uniforms for Yale, their road uniforms will be number 26, Ted McCauley. He can burn. And number 10 is Mike Luzzi. That is Yale's wingback. So 10 is Luzzi, who will be probably on the left-hand side of your screen as Rob Steinberg tees up the football to get ready for the 101st meeting between Yale and Harvard from Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard Stadium. A capacity crowd. And as we told you, the deep men, number 10, Mike Luzzi, number 26, Ted McCauley for Yale. Eight, Rob Steinberg. Now, we're probably going to have a problem with this wind. We will point out the wind is fierce. Of course, we're probably getting it a lot harder than those people down on the floor of the stadium, but the wind is really blowing up here on the roof. So you're saying we're suffering more than they are. We don't have to throw the football like they do, and, and that is going to be a big factor for Yale. All right, here we go. Steinberg kick, and it's not deep, but we're underway, and it comes down, comes short, taken at the 15-yard line. And gang tackled down almost immediately was Mike Flannery. He was the up man for Yale, number 45. We have a flag on the play down at around the 16-yard line. And I believe we have clipping already. And remember, this is such an emotional game. There's a lot of things on the line, including Harvard's chance to still have a piece of the Ivy League. And we have clipping on the opening play against Harvard, Dick. Here's. Well, Yale will be pushed back even further. They did not have good field position to start with, getting it up to the 15-yard line. Well, the line of scrimmage as they start out will be the seven-yard line, the eight-yard line. And that, on the run back. And as you pointed out, Upton, flip on the run back, and number seven, Mike Curtin, trots onto the field, the quarterback. It's all on his shoulders. There you see the rest of the backfield. Klein Coase, Leslie Moriarty, and Quinlivan making up the wide for part of the offense of the offensive line. First play offensively of the ball game. Yale on their own eight-yard line. McCauley across the 10 to the 11-yard line. Brent Wilkinson, the linebacker on the right side, comes in, the junior from Mount Vernon, Ohio, to make the tackle for Harvard. One of the things that we might point out that there has been a change. Number 43, Paul Spivak, is in the place of Dave Klein, who injured himself earlier in the uh, week. So he will be playing at the fullback position. Pick up a three. There, as you see, the defensive unit uh, for Harvard. Second and seven. Line of scrimmage, the 11-yard line. Kevin Moriarty goes out wide on the right side for Yale. You have Spivak. And you have McCauley, who gets his second hand off and goes straight up to about the 15-yard line. So it'll be about a second down and about four. It'll be a third down and about four for the first down. As Barry Ford 
The defensive tackle for Harvard, 6'3", 220 pounder, makes the stop. One of the things that Carm Cosa has said that he would like to control the football because he would like to keep Harvard's ball control team off the field. He does not want to expose his defense early, and he will probably keep the ball on the ground as much as he can. I'm sure he would like to do that. He knows he can't put it up with this fierce wind as Luzzi goes in motion to the right side on this third down and about four. On the rollout, and throws behind Andy Marweedy, so it is incomplete, and Yale will be forced to punt from deep in their own territory, and the young man who will do the punting is the leading punter in the Ivy League, Hank Eaton, with an average of 39 yards a punt. We might point out with a problem with the wind, that time Marweedy was open, wide open, in fact, the tight end, as the tight end was for Pennsylvania last week against Harvard, but he threw behind him, and that's how strong that wind is. All it was was a shot put to him, and he still missed it. At the line of scrimmage, is the 15-yard line, and Chuck Shirey is standing back in single safety for Harvard inside the 50-yard marker, so he's standing in Yale territory. Eaton almost has the block bunt. And rolls out of bounds inside the 40, so Harvard will take over for the first time this afternoon in excellent field position at the 38-yard yard line of Yale. And we're seeing with that ground attack, we're going to zero in on White. We're going to watch the ground attack. Good field position. The wind in their favor. Casey Smith, the adjuster, almost blocked that punt. And I'm sure anytime they have the wind with them, single safety back there, they are going to attempt to block the punt. All right, Brian White has Harvard lined up in the eye, and he puts Coyne out there wide on the left-hand side. You have Santiago and Vignali, two of the best running backs in the Ivy League. As Sabara goes in motion, shifts to a wing on the left side. Vignali gets the first call. And he's knocked up at the line of scrimmage by Ardell McKenna, number 56, the linebacker for Yale, the junior out of Chicago. The Harvard lineup, the backfield and receivers, White, Santiago, Vignali, Sobaro, Pat Coyne, and Steve Abbott, the captain. The offensive line, Costacos, Tio, Jensen, Pascucci, and Karen, the All-Ivy, All-America prospect. Second down and 10 for Harvard. Line of scrimmage remains the Yale 38. White keeps himself. And he is hit back at the 35 after a pickup of three. Carmen Alaco, number 40, the Yale's linebacker who leads the team in tackles in there first to make the hit on White. I think we are going to see early people giving White a good shot, and particularly Zineski, number 69, Alaco, number 40, and 56, McKenna. They are the heart of the defense. Zineski, really, in the tradition of the great middle guards at Yale, an over-aggressive. Third down and seven now for Harvard. The line of scrimmage, the Yale 35-yard line. The wing on the right, double wing set up for Harvard. Sonny on the back, and White wants to throw. Gets pursuit, there. looking for Vignali, wide open at the 10. And Vignali is going to score. Touchdown, Harvard. We're going to see he caught them napping in some ways. Brian White, as he runs off the field, he fakes. Comes to his left. He's got pressure from his right-hand side. Now watch him step up in the pocket and throw it to number 33, Vignali, who has beaten his man clearly. Mike Jarkson, number 39 for Yale. That play action and that roll to the left got him wide open, and his back was left one-on-one -on -one with Jarkson, number 39. They strike quickly. That they do. Their first possession, as they did a week ago, against Penn. Steinberg for the extra point. It is good. And Harvard takes a 7-0 lead over Yale in the first quarter on their first offensive drive of the ball game. And we have 12 minutes and 19 seconds remaining to be played. I think uh, early factors in this game. First of all, Yale won the toss, elected to receive. Harvard took the win. We are going to take a look at number 69, John Zineski. They're all middle guard coming on number 59, Sam Jensen. Now, watch, he gets by Jensen. He gets by his second man. Now he has his hand out on Brian White. This is some of the pressure that was on him, but White makes the throw, which is one heck of a throw. Two men hitting him from the blind side, and Zineski trying to pull him down. I'd say so far, the knee is reacting all right. He certainly looks healthy, doesn't he? Well, Harvard has the 7-0 lead. They jumped out in front, just as they did a week ago in the game against Penn. Only this time, it is home at Cambridge, in front of the home folks in D-game. Getting back to that win factor, Dick, you wonder... Again, the factors as the game goes along, whether in winning the toss, Yale would have been better off kicking off and taking the wind early. Harvard had the wind early. Well, that answers it, doesn't it? Just take yeah. a look at that Harvard oh. flag whipping above Harvard Stadium here. 
And all afternoon, somebody's going to have to put a finger on the ball because it'll blow off the tee in any kicking situation. And that's what they're doing now as Steinberg gets, a, gets set to kick off to Yale for the second time of the ball game. It is Luzzy, number 10 in McCauley, number 26, the deep man for Yale, standing in the vicinity of the goal line as Steinberg kicks off for the second time. McCauley takes it at the 10. And he's hit and brought down at the 15-yard line as coming down there, Kent Tarsey made the hit. The cornerback for Harvard made the hit on the kickoff. Excellent coverage. Well, it is. And uh, the problems that Harvard had last week in their kicking game, and their special teams have played very poorly in the second half. Uh, today, so far, with the win, their special teams have been outstanding. Hill now with their second offensive possession of the ball game. Line of scrimmage. The 15 yard line, that's exactly where they started the first time they had it. Mike Curtin puts Luzzy in motion to the left side. Ted McCauley, he hurdles a man and brought down at the 16 yard line. Defensive end number 12, Steve Anderson, the senior from San Leandro, California, in there to make the initial hit. We're going to take a look at Ted McCauley, who is their breakaway threat out of the eye formation. He is the tailback. He's the deepest back with Spivak leading. Fine block by Spivak. But the adjuster, K. Smith, makes the play because it gives Anderson, number 12, a chance to come up and make the play. They are coming up close and forcing, looking for the run by Yale, which means they've got to loosen them up a little bit. They only gain two, so it is second down and eight as Marotta goes in motion to the left side now. And the handoff up the middle. And a big hole. And Spivak, the fullback, takes it up close to the 30-yard line before Tarzi brings him down. Number 85. And Paul Spivak, the senior out of New Haven, Connecticut, a 5'9", 180-pounder, who drew the starting assignment a week ago. All right, rips we're going it out to for take the first down. What happens from a linebacker position? There are traps. And what happened was Spivak came right over 51, Marty Martinson, but also the guards pulled and trapped Dave Finicus, number 51, who was trapped quite a lot in the Penn game last week. They think that might be a weakness on the Harvard defense. Line of scrimmage to 29. And hit back at the 30-yard line as the wind really blowing down on that field. Finicus and Bennett team up to make the tackle on McCauley. Well, we take a look at that front three, front three to front five, depending upon how they set up their defense. But if there was a weakness with that club last week, Joe Rustic is talking and they're telling him of whatever he wants to tell him for the next offensive coordination. It was in the front five of Harvard, not in their defensive secondary. Second down and eight, line of scrimmage, the 31-yard line. Murata in motion. McCauley just smothered in the line of scrimmage by Brent Wilkinson, number 48 for Harvard. Yale not finding anything going in the middle of that Harvard defensive unit. Their best chance is the quick opener, is the sprint draw, is anything that they can do inside. Counters that Penn used against Harvard last week. They're going to have to be satisfied with that, but I still think Dick, as they did in the first series when he missed Marwee, they're going to have to roll that quarterback, Curtin, and get him out there, even if he just dumps the ball five yards to loosen up that Harvard defense. Third down and eight now for Yale at the 32. Listen to you, and that's Kevin Moriarty, but out of bounds, they say, incomplete at the 40-yard line. We're going to take a look now at Harvard's top defensive secondary that had problems last week. We'll watch it today. Watch them backing up into their zone. In this case, the short man bumps his man. Moriarty, his man, is giving him entirely too much cushion. That's Tarsi, number 85. You can see what happens when you give a guy like Moriarty, who's one of the best receivers in the Ivy League, too much cushion. That should have been a completion if he was not out of bounds. Well, watch that as the day goes along. All right, Hank Eaton will be punting from around his 19-yard line. Chuck Shirey in single safety. Eaton bobbles the ball and tries to throw it. It's locked loose. Harvard's going to scoop it up on the 15 of Yale. Well, Harvard catches a big break on the bobble punt attempt by Eaton. All right, we're going to take a look at another mistake as far as Yale is concerned, but this is a big one. Eaton fumbles the snap. Now he's looking every which way to run, and what you shouldn't do is what Gary Yoprimian did in the Super Bowl years ago is to try to throw the ball up for grabs. You fall down it and take your chances. Now Harvard has the ball inside. In fact, it's on the 15-yard line. 
Great pressure by Harvard. And we did say early, Dick, that with the win in Harvard's favor that they would be coming after the putter. So far, nothing has gone right for Yale as they trail Harvard 7 to nothing. The first time that Harvard had the ball, they moved downfield in three plays, 38 yards, and uh, culminated with the Vignali 35-yard TD pass reception to take the 7 nothing lead. And then uh, Yale, with a second offensive attempt of the afternoon, put into a punting situation, and the punt bobbled, and then the attempted pass by Eaton went awry, and Harvard recovers the football on the 15 with a golden opportunity to punch it in again real quick in the first quarter with a lot of time remaining already, 9.45 in this first quarter. Well, it's hard sitting at home maybe to realize how bad this wind is here, but we got to tell you, it's not hankies down there, it's paper. And down on the sideline, Sean McDonough. Well, Upton and Dick, you are absolutely right. The wind is certainly a factor. Not only is that flag whipping across Harvard Stadium, but it is really whipping around down here in the field. As you can see, trash is beginning to litter a field. And as a matter of fact, that might be a factor. There are popcorn boxes and potato chip wrappers that are on the field. But it's windy, it's cold, and no doubt about it, if Harvard gets ahead by a lot, a considerable margin, say they score another touchdown here, Yale's going to have a tough time throwing the football in the wind. And when they do throw it, they're going to have a tough time catching it because their hands are going to be very cold. My tongue's cold. Back to the booth. Well, it almost looks like Harvard can beat Syracuse today. First down at the 15-yard line. The Crimson of Harvard, of course, who will be waiting when they resume play. And there is Yale's record, uh, overall 5-3. and three. They started out with those two tough losses. They beat Brown every place but on the scoreboard. Lost to the University of Connecticut convincingly. And then finally found themselves against Morgan State. Came back with a win over Dartmouth that you saw here on the Ivy League game of the week. Went by and came from behind against Columbia. Gave Penn a scare before Yale made a fatal error with six minutes and 50 seconds to go in that football game. And then went on, and then the fabulous comeback against Princeton last week. But here it's Harvard on the 15 of Yale with their second offensive series of the afternoon. They already lead 7-0. McNally. Lots of room to the five. Inside the five, and he's down to the three-yard line is Mark McNally. John Zaneski and Steve Pender, 69 and 46, make the stop. In this replay, we watch Mark Vignali, number 33, but watch 14, Santiago. What a block he puts on two men to open it up for Vignali. And people only know Santiago as a fine, outstanding running back, but there he made that play. He took a piece of both men, Dick, and opened it up for Vignali, and they're down there knocking again. With a first and goal to go from the three yard line. McNally gets the call. And McNally is the touchdown marker up. Yes, it is. Hands in the air. Touchdown. McNally has scored his second touchdown of the first quarter. And Mark McNally now has seven on the season. And Harvard has a 13-0 lead. When you have two people in the backfield like Santiago and McNally, and they're looking for both, you see Santiago in front. He'll be the lead blocker. He moves inside. Santiago reads T.O. number 60's block beautifully. Number 39, Tony Resch is the only guy that has a shot at him. And in that foot race, the back usually wins. And Rob Steinberg will be attempting the extra point. He's 18 for 18 on the season. And make that 19 for 19. And Harvard leads Yale 14 to nothing here in the first quarter at Harvard Stadium. We mentioned earlier about the possibility the team who wins this game wins the Big Three championship. For those who might not know, the Big Three championship is the one who is victorious, who comes out the best of it in the Yale, Harvard, and Princeton series. And seeing that, seeing that they have the both have a win over Princeton, the winner of today's game would win that. Here's Harvard statistics on the season. Victorious over Columbia, lost the Holy Cross and Army back to back, and then went on to win over Cornell, Dartmouth, Princeton, and Brown, and then lost last week to Penn, 38 to 7. Well, I think we've been answered early about how Harvard's attitude would be coming into this game. I know it is the game against Yale, but still, that beating was one of the worst in their history, and it was a very close game in the first half, and it opens up the second half, and Steve Ortman of Penn runs it all the way back, and all of a sudden, Harvard is out of it. And loses 38 to 7. They come in here today with a quarterback who is questionable or was questionable coming in the game. But if you remember this game and the things that happened so far, the wind has been the biggest factor in Harvard's favor. That it has to date, plus the execution of number seven, Brian White, the running and pass receiving of number 33, Mark McNally. 9-12 remaining in the first quarter. 
The deep men again for Yale. Number 10, Mike Lussie. And number 26, Ted McCauley. Looking directly into the sun over Harvard Stadium. I thought the sun never set here. Once again, as we pointed out, there will be no free standing of that ball on the tee. The wind is too strong. It has to be held. Feinberg really booms it. And this one goes out of the back of the end zone. So for the first time this season, we will see the new rule put into effect and the ball will be brought out to the 30-yard line. I've been waiting all season to say that. Well, you finally got it. The wind did you a favor and finally got it for you. And it appears so far everything is going right for Harvard. And here's the arithmetic on Harvard's last scoring drive, taking only 33 seconds to accomplish in two plays as they lead 14 to nothing. Now, Dick, I think that we have to see Yale, even with the wind against them, open up a little bit more. You don't want to get down any more than 14 to nothing. A lot of these games come back to you, and Yale, has, if they've stuck close to a team, have always been able to come back in the last couple of minutes. All right, Yale with their best field position of the afternoon so far, the 30-yard line, that due to the kick. There's McCauley. Hurdles across the 35 to the 36-yard line. Cornerback uh, Ken Tarzi, number 85, made the tackle and down on the sidelines with some scores, Sean McDonough. All right, gentlemen, some scores from around the country, just down the road in Foxborough, Massachusetts, Boston College taking on Syracuse. Upton hanging for the score at 7-7 in the second quarter. At halftime, it's Florida 12, Kentucky 3. Second quarter action, Navy 7, South Carolina 7. More after this. Second down and 6 for Yale at their own 36-yard line. Murata in motion. Ball speed back. Up close to the 39-yard line. With a gain of about 3 as Wilkinson and Bennett make the tackle. And with more scores, Sean McDonough. Thank you, Richard. Notre Dame 21, Penn State 7 there in the second quarter. And how about that one? Jerry Faust making a bid to keep his job. Maryland 7, Clemson nothing there in the first quarter. 7 nothing. Ohio State leads Michigan. Ohio State, if they win, will go to the Rose Bowl. Second quarter at 7-7, Iowa State against Oklahoma State. And it's West Virginia 10, Temple 7 there in the second quarter. Those are all the scores we have right now. Here at Cambridge, Massachusetts, Yale with a third down and two, looking for their first first down of the afternoon across the 41. That should be good enough for the first down. It is, and the Eli's have picked up their first first down as Steve Anderson, number 12, and Wilkinson, number 48, combined to make the tackle. Actually, uh, they wanted that badly enough that Curtin was the lead blocker on that toss, and really was the reason that uh, they got the first down. As you pointed out, Upton, Yale is going to have to show something real quick. When you're down 14-0 in the first quarter, you just cannot afford to get that much more into a hole. Well, now that your defense keeps getting closer and closer to the line of scrimmage, you're putting more pressure on. On a misdirection, that's Mike Luzzi, but they're waiting for him. He gets up to about the 44. Steve Anderson, number 12, is there to greet him. What makes football so different from any other sport is all the game plan stick you work on during the week, talking to both coaches, laying out what they were going to do, some of the things that worked for Penn against Harvard, some of the things that Yale did, and you come in here and you get a windy day, and you could get an injury, the bounce of the ball, and all of a sudden your team's 14 and nothing down, and then you have to depart somewhat from your game plan. Only a yard gain on that last play, so it is second and nine at the 43. Yale in their white road uniforms. Murata goes in motion to the left side. Burton rolls to that right, but he is going to be nailed by Steve Anderson, number 12, who had just rolled right into that play, read it perfectly, and Peter Mackey was there too as well. But number 12, Steve Anderson, the key. Well, that's what they want to do. They want to put enough pressure on Curtin because they know that he's going to attempt to do what Chuck McGeehan did last week against Harvard. He rolled out with both the backs in front of him, and there was no pressure from the back side. This time, Anderson came from one side, and Mackey got through on his side of the line of scrimmage and chased him from the back side. Pressure has got to be on the quarterback when he sprints out or he has too much time to throw. And there's too much yardage as far as Mr. Curtin is concerned to pick up. It's third down and 14 here at the 38 after that loss. Wants the throw. Looking for Luzzi. Incomplete at the midfield strike. And it'll be fourth down coming up once again. So Yale has had the ball three times, and they are forced to punt the ball three times. Number 10, Mike Luzzi, is going to go down about eight yards and make his cut to the right. The ball should be thrown as he breaks. It wasn't thrown as he broke, and it was a little bit high, and it was incomplete. He was hit. 
Once again, Eaton will be punting. This is his third punt, and he's punting into a wind, and Shirey stands back at his own 28. This is a clean snap this time, and the wind just catches that ball. Shirey uh -oh. takes it, fumbles the football, Yale covers it at the 23-yard line. So Yale catches a break on the wind, due to the wind. It was Ardell McKenna, number 56, who pounced on the football. And Ardell McKenna is their second leading tackler. Shari should have never tried to catch this football at that angle. He was not in front of it properly. He should have signaled for a fair catch or moved away from the football. We'll take a look at another angle. Now, he's moving to his right. There's sun in his eyes. He has no idea the location of the ball. McKenna, 56, moves in. Here's the break that Yale has needed to get themselves back in this game. And they need to capitalize on it, more importantly, as Luzzi goes in motion to the left side. McCalling, he bangs to the 20, picks up about five yards. It'll be second down and five as Dave Finicos, the middle guard, number 51, and Dan Bennett, number 56, the linebacker, form the tandem to bring him down. I think one of the other things we're going to see here, they're running the football, they're concerned that they get good field position. But field goal kicking against this wind, even down, if you get the ball down the 10-yard line, is going to be difficult there. Absolutely correct. The wind is just swirling throughout this stadium. It is second down and four. Long four for that first down. Murata in motion to the right side. Spivak gets the call. He's down or close to the 17-yard line. Bennett in there initially for Harvard, number 46, the senior out of Sherbourne. Massachusetts history major. I guess they feel that they can move it on the ground in small charts against Harvard. Uh, but again, they've got to be mindful. This is an opportunity with this win the way it is that they cannot blow. In third down conversions, Yale is one for three in the ball game so far. It is third down and two, and this is a key at the 17-yard line of Harvard. Was the emotion? And Spivak up the middle, he picks up the first down inside the 15 to the 14-yard line. The interior quickly closed, Wilkinson and Bennett for Harvard. Well, Marty Wilkinson, number 51, that line comes off that ball, and you can see it stands people up enough for him to get the first down, but the key to the whole thing was their captain, Marty Martinson, number 51, came off the ball, Spivak came in right in behind him, drove his man, and they got the first down. He lies out of the huddle. They put Moriarty, number 82. Keep your eye on him. He's their Mr. Clutch on this first down from the 15-yard line closer to the 14 as Murata goes in motion again. Macaulay, second man through, spins to the 10 and brought down at the 9 as adjuster back Casey Smith, number 18, rides him down at the 9-yard line. I'll tell you, that counter is working as it did with Penn, at least on that play. They run the back one way. They hand off to Macaulay the other way. And they pull the guard, and it worked. Well, there you see the seasonal stats. Yale has good second and fourth quarters. Harvard fourth quarter as well is their better, their better one. It is second down and five for the first down for Yale. The line of scrimmage is the nine-yard line of Harvard. Luzzi in motion. White roll on the uh, curtain rolls, and he gets close to the 60-yard line as Wilkinson and Finicos team up to bring him down. Both quarterbacks this afternoon. Wearing number seven, curtain and white. All right, we're going to take a look at another angle, a low ground angle of Yale coming off the ball. 51 Martinson makes his block. Right in behind that right-hand side of that Yale line, Wazlowski, Sparra, and Quindlin, the tight end. They're getting penetration on that Harvard defense. Once again, it is third down and two. McCauley has 31 yards in nine carries. Speed back. Inside the five, down to the three-yard line. It looks like he might have picked up the first down. Finicos and Wilkinson once again, 51 and 48 for Harvard, making the tackle. But Spivak with hard running. Finicos isn't Picks quick. up that first yeah. down. He is not big, and they've been able to move him, Dick. And Spivak is really a great story. This kid played hardly for, for Yale this year. Got an opportunity to play when Dave Klein got hurt, and they think he's their best blocker and a good short yardage back, and certainly shown that. I have to say, Spivak, number 43, really looking good on second effort performances. First and goal to go from the four. Spivak gets the call. He's in the end zone. Touchdown. This time they came off the left-hand side 
Harvard's right hand side. Spivak is hit initially at the line by number 18, K. Smith, Casey Smith, the adjuster. Now watch the legs continue to move as he takes it in the extra yard for a touchdown, but he was stopped by K.C. Smith, and that's what we're talking about, good short yard runner. Bill Moore attending the extra point number three. He's 19 for 21 on extra point conversions this season. It's up. It is good. And the score now is Harvard 14, Yale 7, here in the first quarter with two minutes and 35 seconds remaining to be played. It's up, and the ball probably will never come down again. <laughs> it got up in the air. I've, I've never seen an extra point like that. The ball got up in the air. It looked like a balloon floating. <laughs> It is windy, and that is the understatement of the afternoon here at Cambridge, Massachusetts. Well, it all depends on how you take your medicine with the ale back in the game, 14 to 7. That wind in the fourth quarter, if they're close, again is going to be a factor because the wind is not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. And Sean McDonough was talking about papers on the field. We thought it was Hankey's first, although it's too early in the game as we look at Joe Rustic. Oh, yeah. But there are more papers swirling around down there than I've seen anywhere. So for the first time this afternoon, as you see the Yale flag blowing in the breeze above Harvard Stadium, the deep men for Harvard, Joe Pusatari, number 42, and number 31, Rufus Jones, the return men. I bet you Shari wish he has, has that bat, and it, it's difficult to remind a guy of, of what happens to him in a game, but coaches try to tell their players in big games where wind is a factor and the sun, Carmen Koza looks a little calmer now, don't touch the football. Don't let a team back in the ball game again. And that's exactly what Harvard did when he dropped the puck. Well, here you see Bill Moore kicking off for the first time this afternoon. It's that little sidewinder. Doesn't have much on it. Scooped up at the 25. Fumble. A ball loose again. I think Harvard had it. No way for the call. Sabara dropped it. Yale players are happy, but no official word yet. Now the official word. Yale has Bob it. Bob Dooley. Bob Dooley came up with it. Here is the kickoff with this crazy win, a factor all day long. Now trying to get a handle on his number 40, George Sabara. You can see he gets it in his hands, and then he drops it. Yale recovers. Here's another look at it from another angle trying to handle a football on a day like today. He never had complete control of the ball. Yale's ball again. Again, and this time they have it at the 20. They give it to Luzzi on a misdirection, and Luzzi takes it to the 15-yard line. So he picks up five. It'll be second down and five. Casey Smith coming up from the adjuster back position to make the tackle for Harvard. Dick, this is unbelievable. I've done games in the snow and, and, and the rain and seen so many weather factors, but today to have two things like this happen in a row to get a team back in the game, it's just so unusual. I've never seen the wind swirl the way it is at the bottom of this stadium. But it does it here, and it does it often, and you get used to it if you play here, and Harvard knows that. It is second down and five for Yale. This time they're waiting for Spivak. There'll be no gain as Peter Mackey, number 83, the defensive left tackle, 6'6", 240-pound senior from Wellesley, Mass, makes the hit. Harvard this time stopped it. It is a straight handoff with the guard pulling to Spivak, who's trying to break it outside. No way. Mackey, number 83, stops it right in its tracks. But Yale will run those plays and run that power offense until Harvard stops it. Well, Yale has a third down and five at the 15-yard line of Harvard with an opportunity to put themselves right back in this ball game as they trail 14 to seven. Luzzy in motion. Big call. And they are waiting for Mr. McCauley. And that's Barry Ford, number 95. He is so good for Harvard. The defensive right tackle, 6'3", 218 pounds, senior from Poughkeepsie, New York, from Peekskill, New York. A difference between breaking it all the way and being caught by 95-4. Now, that's the fastest replay you're ever going to see, but we wanted you to see how quickly these backs get to the line. 
what happened was McCauley did not follow Spivak in his blocking. The hole was open inside. He chose to run it outside, and there was 95 Ford, who was suckered, who made the play. Well, they're going to attempt maybe a 34-yard field goal. The holder is Luzzy. Remember, he was a former quarterback. Bill Moore attempting. They spot the ball. He boots it up. It looks like it's got distance. It's good. Bill Moore hits on a 34-yard field goal, and the score is now Harvard 14, Yale 10. Well, Carmen Cosa feels a little more relaxed now. 14 to 10, though, is better than 14 to 14. Yale got something out of it. Harvard was able to stop the touchdown. But now they've got to do something about their special teams because it has cost them again. In this case, it isn't them kicking the ball short. It's the people handling the football. And I'll tell you something, I would not tee the ball up the rest of the day. I'd put the ball down flat and kick it. I don't care if it goes 15 yards. You know something? I might not disagree with you on that. You know, I haven't seen it, but I probably wouldn't. The wind is just such an unbelievable factor. Well, we can bore you by telling you that. We're just going to let you watch the game. It is 14-10 with 33 seconds remaining in the first quarter. Harvard is out in front. They scored the first two times they had possession of the football, and then two consecutive kick bobbles by Harvard. Yale pounced on it to 25 and the 20 and converted into scoring opportunities. One on a touchdown by Spivak on a four-yard run, the other on a 34-yard field goal by Bill Moore, who is teeing the football up, and Murata will do the holding. The deep men again, Puzatari 42 for Harvard, 31, Rufus Jones to the left. And again, Moore tries that bobbler to Scribbler, and it's picked up by Brian O'Neill, and O'Neill takes it out to the 38-yard line. Brian O'Neill carries out to the 38, and the tackle made in there by Flannery, Mike Flannery. Harvard might now want to go back to ball control, see if they can take a little steam out of Yale, It'll be the smartest thing for them to do, nothing fancy. Let's see if the running game's going, see if we can control the football and get a little semblance of order back at this club. Brian White has Harvard split with uh, Sabaro in the slot on the left and Coin White out there Bobble. on the left and bobbles the football. And again, he pounces on it. It looks like uh, White has recovered and covered his own yep. bobble back there. He never got complete control of it, but Brian White appeared to me to have some problems recovering this. As you can see, he never really gets a snap. He's looking for it around bottom of his legs and luckily Harvard falls on it it was Santiago I still want to see how he's operating for a full half on that knee he didn't look like he was fluid on that no it did not his leg looked like he was just stiff a little bit well there's the end of the first quarter the time runs down with the score Harvard 14 and Yale 10 this experience it lives on our fields and in our classrooms where every day is a test. Each moment builds on this experience and creates an environment that develops mind, body, and soul. We become part of the storied traditions of the Ivy League. This experience, it is unrivaled. We hope you're enjoying our re-air, the Yale-Harvard game from 1984. It was a fast start for the team up north. The fumbles have led us back in here as Harvard leads here at the start of the second quarter, 14-10. to 10. A big part of the Bulldogs' rally has been the run game. So let's talk to a member of the offensive line. And joining us again is Otto Weimer. And Otto, Harvard is no doubt the biggest rival on the schedule. Yeah, by far this game meant the most to us. Coming into Harvard, um, this game was going to mean, you know, payback for, you know, years of losses, uh, but also an opportunity for us to end the season on a high note. Um, it was a cold day, packed stadium. Um, you know, it was, uh, my recollection that when, when I had been uh, in, at the Harvard Horseshoe as a sophomore, um, I got to have my ankles in the Sports Illustrated photo of the MIT balloon blowing up at uh, the kickoff after halftime. But a lot of, um, you know, excitement about coming into this game and the opportunity for us to end on a real high note. When Yale and Harvard meet, you go to the other stadium every other year. And there's something a little extra special as a player about making the trip up to Boston. 
Well, it's a Harvard game, you know, in the three each of my years was always a game you got up for. It didn't matter what happened the weekend before, um, whether you're on the road or you're at home, you just got pumped. Um, it was a chance for you to go out. And it was, for us, it was our last game of the season and potentially of our football playing history. Um, so for each of us, it, a lot of meaning uh, built into the game. And certainly being in Boston, um, certainly being at um, Harvard Stadium meant an awful lot and just keying us up. Do you have any specific memories from this game? And you all were able to overcome a slow start to the year with a lot of momentum over the final weeks of the season. Yeah, well, a couple. Paul Spivak, who was one of our running backs, who really hadn't played an awful lot during the season, but decided to really make his mark in the Harvard game. I remember one counter play coming around the corner and kicking out either the, the cornerback or the safety and having Spivak run. And it's actually a photograph I've got on my wall. Um, there was a local photographer in New Haven who used to take black and white photos um, of the team and the games. And it's one of those that just, you know, you look at the fire in Spivak's eyes um, and, you know, coming around or in scoring, you know, going down under a punt. I was a long snapper as well. Um, and, you know, trapping Harvard, you know, on the two yard line. Um, those are a couple of the memories that stick out uh, from that game in particular. Otto, when we talk to Coach Reno, he always talks about Yale being a 40 year decision, not a four year decision. And for you, how has your Yale football experience shaped your life and career after football was over? You know, it definitely has. Um, a lot of the intestinal fortitude built in those four years uh, with losing seasons and also the turmoil you go through and the self-doubt. But, um, you know, coming off the high end of the winning the Harvard-Yale game senior year, um, you know, it is something I look back on. Some of my best friends are guys that I played football with at Yale. Um, and, uh, you know, continue to be strong forces in my life. Otto, we thank you for your time and insight as we celebrate the Yale Harvard rivalry with this game from your senior year. Hey, thank you. That was Otto Weimer, Yale class of 1985. Don't go anywhere as we head back to Harvard Stadium to the legend Dick Galliott and Upton Bell. Scrimmage of the 33, Spivak up to the 35, picks up a couple. It'll be second down and eight for Yale when they come out of the huddle. Tackle made by Brent Wilkinson, number 48, for Harvard. Both clubs five and three, but Harvard is five and one in league play. Yale is four and two in league play. And even though it's the Yale game, they've got to be thinking about what's happening up in Cornell on the artificial turf. Cornell and Penn, if, if Harvard was to win, they could still share it if Penn lost. Let's not forget that Harvard has shared this title for the past two seasons. Second down and eight, Yale at their own 35. White finds Moriarty out around the 43-yard line, very close to the first down, as Tarzi there to make the hit on Moriarty, who picks up his first reception of the afternoon. One of the things that Tarzi is doing, and maybe he's afraid of Moriarty's speed and ability, and we're going to see Kevin Moriarty, who is their deep threat and one of the more dangerous receivers in the Ivy League. Now the quarterback, Curtin, is sprinting out to his right. He has both McCauley and Spivak in front of him. McCauley goes down eight yards, makes his curl in, but I'll tell you, Tarzi, number 85, is giving him too much cushion. Third down now and a short one for the first down at the 43-yard line. Spivak gets the call, tries it once, twice, and I don't believe he picked it up, but we'll wait to see where they spot the football. As Harvard was ready, everybody was there. Wilkinson, Bennett, Finicos. It'll all be on where they put their foot down. And Cecil unfiled. Cox pushed him back. That's the big thing. Where do you place the ball? He might have made it, but Cecil Cox came right in on the top of that pile and pushed him back, and they've got to measure, I'm sure. And that's what they're going to do as the official calls the timeout. Mistakes will come in from the far side. And Sean McDonough has some more updates for us. Well, gentlemen, as we mentioned moments ago, there's some very important games around the country day as far as the bowl picture is concerned and that sort of thing. And it does sound like from the roar of the background, Yale has picked up the first down. Syracuse leads Boston College 10 to 7 there at the half at Sullivan Stadium. Florida at the half leading Kentucky 12 to 3. Also at halftime, an upset in the making. Navy 14, number two ranked South Carolina 7. And try this one on for size up to Notre Dame 31, Penn State 7. They're still in the second quarter. Here at Harvard Stadium, Yale has a first down at the 44. McCauley gets a little room. 
And McCauley inside into Harvard territory down to the 46. Ken Tarzi trips him up number 85. But McCauley, who comes into the ball game today, averaging five yards a carry. All right, we'll find out why he does. This is a counter. McCauley reads the block beautifully on the right-hand side. Gets eight yards out of it. He's reading his blockers beautifully. And with just that little delay that they have, he came in behind Paul Weimer, number 71, who had pulled from his tackle position. McCauley followed him beautifully. They are using those counters somewhat the way Penn did, Dick, when they get running room. McCauley has 10 carries for 42 yards. Picked up the first down at the Harvard 46. Marauder in motion. Drop back. Wright wants to go. Looking for Moriarty. Wide open. Moriarty. At the 20. The 15. And Moriarty will go out of bounds inside the 10-yard line at the 8-yard line. For a 38-yard pass play. Yale very rarely drops straight back and throws. That is not Curtin's way of doing it. And we're going to take a look at the secondary and find out why Mr. Moriarty got clear. He came in behind the corner and the safety three Cox. He ran a curl pattern, almost a post pattern inside. Now he's just running speed alone to the left side of the field. But they are giving him entirely too much cushion. Now it is first down and goal to go from the eight. McCauley bobbles it, hangs on, is not going to get any yardage, gets left to the line of scrimmage as Anderson there to smother him, number 12. In that case, Harvard really had to, what you would call double coverage. They were in a zone. The, the front man played him, but he circled in behind the front man, who was number 85, Ken Tarzi, who I said has been giving him too much to, room to run his patterns, which means Cecil Cox had to pick him up. Now it is second down goal to go from the eighth. The air lines up in the eye. They put Murata out wide on the right-hand side, and we have officials calling timeout. Looks like there's a flag down for some reason, too. There is so much blowing on that field. There, there's debris all over it, and uh, that was why they picked up a, an item that had been thrown out, I guess, or blown out. All right, second down and goal to go from the eight. Yale trailing 14 to 10. They give it to Spivak, Again. and Spivak slices to the one. He's ridden down at the one. That's Brian Bergstrom, number 27, riding him down with Cecil Cox. Right over that left side comes Spivak. Out of the eye formation, he is the fullback. Hand off, the guard pulls, the center pushes his man down. He comes in behind both of them. The stop made by Cox, number three, but they are getting penetration. And it is now third down and goal to go from the one. Yale knocking on the door. Yale could go out in front. Spivak, he slams in, touchdown, and Spivak, Paul Spivak has scored his second touchdown of the afternoon for Yale to put Yale out in front after Yale trailed 14-0. Well, in this case, the last two handoffs are nothing but power football behind your center and guard on the right side. This time, the replay, ground level. You'll see him take the handoff behind the center, 51 Martinson, and the right guard, Weslowski, number 75. Here is another angle at it. You can see Harvard being driven back. Watch 18, Casey Smith, and three being driven back, Cecil Cox. That's called coming off the ball at the line of scrimmage when you have to score. Power football. Power football, Weselowski, Martinson, Matthews, Weimer, Squora doing their job. And Yale now has put themselves not only back in the ball game, but out in front after they trailed 14 to nothing early in the first quarter. 9.38 remaining in the second quarter as Bill Moore will be attempting the extra point. Moore gets it up there, and it is good, and Yale is out in front. 17 to 14. Got a flag down, I think, and I don't know if they'll assess the penalty unless it's somebody throwing a yellow handkerchief on the field. They'll probably assess the penalty on the kickoff, but there was a flag on the extra point try. We're going to pause just a moment in our coverage of this game between the Crimson and the Bulldogs with the score, Yale 17, Harvard 14.
Back here at Harvard Stadium, Dick Galliott, Upton Bell, Sean McDonough. Yale has just gone downfield and gone out in front 17 to 14 with Spivak plunge from the one after trailing 14 to nothing. An incredible roughing the, comeback. In roughing the kicker penalty was assessed, so Yale is kicking off from the Harvard 45. The deep men, Joe Puzatari, number 42, Rufus Jones, number 31. Bill Moore says he's ready. This time Onside he goes for an onside kick. They've got the ball. And Yale is recovered. Number 45 for Mike Yale. Mike Flannery. Mike, Mike Flannery. Flannery. Incredible that they did that on top of You talk about a change in momentum. They tried an onside kick with this win with great field position with the opportunity to put Harvard back where they wanted them with that offense. They are going for it all. The surge in the Yale offense, I think, just said to them, this is the time to pull. If we're going to pull something, now's the time to do it. Well, Bill Moore has redeemed himself with his coach, Carm Koza, after what he did against Penn. It is first down yet at the 32. McCauley, he sticks his head in there, and he's being ridden back down by Steve Anderson, number 12, the defensive end for Harvard. Picks up a couple. It'll be second down and eight. How quickly the complexion of a Harvard-Yale game can change when Harvard, along with the win, dominated. Yale comes back with Harvard letting them off the hook. Yale takes advantage of it and then comes back and scores, really leading to the score, a 32-yard pass play. Feedback, 12 carries, 35 yards, two touchdowns for the Elias. Second down and seven, line of scrimmage at the 29-yard line of Harvard as Murata goes in motion. And they give it up the middle, Spivak. Moves gang tackled down by the interior. Dan Bennett, 46, Wilkinson, 48. Picks up a couple more. It'll be about third down and six for the first down. If there's a story of the Yale offense in this first half, it has to be number 43, Paul Spivak, who stepped in for an injured Dave Klein, who played very little for this club this year. In fact, I told you one time I ran into his parents at dinner, and they were talking about he did not have a lot of playing time. This kid has come on and had one great day for himself so far. He was a great prep school star at Shelton, Wallingford. Third down and six at the 28. McCauley tries to turn it outside, but Anderson gets away from Anderson, now hit by Bennett, and uh, Dan Bennett gets him, and also Steve Anderson comes to finish it off. You know, Dick, sometimes when you get the momentum and you're successful with the inside game, you think maybe it's time to go outside, but I don't think they're going to try and go outside. I think inside's where they can move them out. You do what you do best, and that was it. I agree with you there. Stay with what you had to get you there until it runs dry. Well, not only that, you've got the lead. All right, Bill Moore is going to be attempting a 44-yard field goal. He has a 34-yarder. Gets it off, it's got distance, and it's good. It's good. Bill Moore hits a 44-yard field goal. You know, there are streaks in life when you can do nothing wrong. I will it against the wind and with the win. I will point out, however, that Bill Moore owns the Yale kicking record with a 52-yarder. All right, we're going to take a look at Bill Moore. He follows through. He's kind of a sidewinder. Muzzy says to him, you did it, gives him a big hug, and he ought to because he's kicked two key field goals, one with the win and one against the win, and usually a sidewinder. Dick, in this win, the way it's blowing across the field, has no chance. That's what I'm marveling at. Really, a sidewind kicker is right. Look at these kickers in the stand. <laughs> How many kickers do you think they've had? 7.38 to play in this first half, and Yale, who trailed 14-0 so early in the first quarter, has now come back with 20 unanswered points to take the lead by six. Well, now we're going to find out about Harvard's poise and uh, just how they plan to attack this situation. They have lost the momentum, and they better quickly gain it back because this wind is getting worse and it is getting darker, and there's 7.38 left in the, in the first half. And all the misfortune that's happened to Harvard on the turnovers has resulted in Yale points. As Moore kicks off, this time he goes a little deeper. Rufus Jones lets it go out the back of the end zone, and Harvard will have the football at their own 20-yard line. Oh, the Crimson. There's Paul Spivak with two touchdowns this afternoon. A New Haven, Connecticut youngster who is having the time of his life. Coming to stardom in a name now that will never be forgotten his because father, of his performance. That's right. His father will put him right in his Wall Street firm. His father's a very <laughs> famous Wall Street lawyer. 
I've got to ask you, as somebody who's done 20-some Yale games in, in a row, where does this stand on your list of surprises? <laughs> After sitting in this stadium in 68, nothing surprises me watching that game. Anything can happen. Here you see Santiago. Santiago with room across the 25 and out of bounds at the 25-yard line. He picks up five. It'll be second down and, and five. One thing that Carm Koza said this week is that if they, by chance, got on top, the one thing they did not want to do is let Santiago outside. That they were scared to death that they felt this was one of the quickest, fastest backfields he's ever faced and that they had to contain him. They did not want him getting outside. And I'll tell you the reason why the young man leads this league in rushing and with that blazing speed, Harvard has a second down and four at their own 26. White pitches to Santiago, and there is uh, Carmen Alacqua, number 40. They hit him first, and they throw him for the loss. Jacobucci over there quickly. And the line of scrimmage will be back at the 23-yard line. When you're playing with the lead, and your name is number 40, Carmen Alacqua, and you see the man coming down the line of scrimmage white and pitching to Santiago again, as I said, they don't want to let him outside. The linebacker, Alacqua, played it beautifully, and so did Jacobucci, the stand-up man, perfectly. Harvard is 0 for 1 in third down conversions. They have a third down and 7. Line of scrimmage to 23, their own. Uh -oh. And White is going to be sacked back there. Coming in there is John Quinn, number 16, the junior out of Dover, Massachusetts, to put him down. Back at the 20-yard line. And it'll be fourth down. Hunting situation for Harvard, having to kick into that win. Quinn was not going to let him outside, and he was not going to let him throw. Now Steinberg is standing on his own six-yard line. You have McCauley standing at around midfield. Steinberg has one punt for 36 yards. Too we much have time. Too much time again. Oh, the line of scrimmage is going to be pushed even farther back to the 15-yard line. And this time, Steinberg will be kicking from his goal line. And not only that, if I were Yale, I'd be going after that football. I've got nothing to lose. If my man even lets it bounce, I'm going to get good field position. There is nothing wrong with taking a piece out of it. You don't want to hit the man, but try to force him to squib putt it. McCauley back there. That's number off. All All star. On the up. And he can fly also. Here we go. Steinberg standing on the goal line. Waiting to punt. It is a fourth and 15. The line of scrimmage is the 15. Yale showing that they're going to go. Let's see if they come flying in. They might fake it. They're, they're faking, faking it. it. Right. And Steinberg gets a fine punt. Fair catch signaled for at the 40-yard line of Harvard. Fair catch signaled for by the Eli's John Shen. And the defensive back handled it cleanly. So Yale gets excellent field position after the 26-yard punt. Steinberg kicking into the wind. The 41-yard line is the line of scrimmage. And the score is Yale 20, Harvard 14, 601 left to play in this first half. And you actually have to coach with the wind as being a factor and coach what you're going to do when you have the wind versus what you're going to do when you don't have it. Luzzy in motion to the left side. White wants to throw. Fires complete to Luzzy. And Luzzy is down to the 31-yard line, a pickup of about 10, very close to that first down. He ran a route right down in front of uh, number 48, Brent Wilkinson. And they're going to pick on those linebackers a little bit. He's got both backs out in front of him, Curtin. He's sprinting to his left. He's looking for Luzzy now to clear right in front of 48, Brent Wilkinson. You can see number three, Cecil Cox, is too far off. And then finally, Tarzi, number 85, makes the tackle. But when you sprint out like that, Dick, you, you make the people in the defensive backfield react. And they've been off the receiver too far. All right. It is first down as the stakes are brought back to the far sidelines. And our young rooter, I guess, maybe one of the youngest in the stadium today, no Harvard. doubt about who, who it is rooting for. Or at least his father's putting the costume on it. <laughs> first down, Yale at the 31 of Harvard. He's got time. Pumps once, twice, looking for Murata. And the ball is going to be, I believe, intercepted. Tarzi back there to pick it off. Ken Tarzi. And that is his fourth interception of the season or not? No? Trapped it, they say. They All say right. He trapped it. And I tell you something, Curtin was very lucky to get away with this because as he rolled out to hit Murata, Murata really doesn't know where the ball is, but Tarzi does. No, Tarzi has the ball. Well, I'll tell you from the replay here, 
Uh, we're going to take a look at it another angle. It appears to me that Tarzi makes the interception. All right, the ball is in his stomach. He comes down with the ball. I say that's an interception. So do I. That's what I saw. That's what I called. But the official says differently. Nice job in the truck, fellas. Second down and 10. McCauley gets the call. He stumbles forward to about that 27-yard line. Casey Smith trips him up, number 18. Boy, is that a costly... Well, you can't see how it's an error, at least from our vantage point, for the official because Harvard would have taken it over and stopped their drive finally and maybe their momentum. And clearly, he had possession of that football when he went down, Tarzi number 85. So, hey, listen, everybody's under pressure today. Third down and six with the line of scrimmage, the 28 of Harvard. Third down, long six. They'll split on both sides. He's looking to his right. Here comes Pursuit. That's Collins, who got a piece of his arm. Scott Collins, the linebacker. The sophomore out of Elmhorst, Illinois. Got a piece of the arm, and now Yale is first with a fourth down situation. And are they going to try and punt or they, you know, with the win with them? Field goal, you know, Dick, in that case, what they're doing now is when they see two receivers, Luzzi and Murata, to the same side, they're sending the linebacker from that weak side, and there's nobody back there to protect the quarterback. Well, this time, Bill Moore is going to attempt a 45-yard field goal attempt. 45-yard field goal. From the side. That's the ball. It's got the distance. I don't know if it goes off to the left, but it is off to the left. Had the distance, but off to the left. No good. No more is two for three in field goals this afternoon, and the score remains Yale 20, Harvard 14. And again, with the way you come through the football as a sidewinder, with this type of win, he had plenty of foot behind it, but the ball caught the win and sliced off to the left-hand side. I just want to repeat myself that he does have the Yale kicking record of a 52-yard field goal, and that was not on a windy afternoon. Was it with or against the wind? It was not a windy afternoon. Still a with or against. <laughs> Harvard with the football. First down at their own 28-yard line. Bignale. And Bignale punches out to the 30-yard line, picks up a cover. I'm still not sure yet how good that knee is of Brian White's. He hasn't been sprinting out very much and throwing the football. And when he has thrown the football, it's been more of a semi-roll than anything else. I, I think there's still a question, and I'm sure that Yale is saying we're going to make him pitch the ball. Yesterday afternoon, the poor young man was being besieged by everybody at the freshman game while he was watching. Second down and eight for Harvard. In motion is Sabara. We have movements, and Eski moves across. Whether he was drawn or jumped on his own, the flag is dropped. Anyway, he got so tired of answering the question with everybody saying, what are you going to do tomorrow? White says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to throw 74 times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Big so far, his prediction isn't right, and his <laughs> knee is bulky, and he's got a lot of padding on it, and the wild man of the Osage, Zineski, was the guy <laughs> that came across. Take ball! Ball start! Offense! Boy, Harvard is just not having anything go right since they got their first two scores in that first quarter. It is second down and 13 for the Crimson at their own 25. Point out there wide on that left, so Byer in the slot. Now White runs and does not get anywhere. Goes down at the 25-yard line, the line of scrimmage. So it'll be a third and 13 as McKenna and Ilaqua stop him. No room to move is called this play. They're pulling both guards, and White is looking to cut back in behind Sam Jensen, number 59 block, but they cut that off. I'll tell you another interesting matchup, number 69, Zineski. Your buddy at nose guard against number 63, Roger Karen, the top pro prospect, 270 pounds. Last time, he handled them easily. Third down and 12 for Harvard. Line of scrimmage, they're 25. And White takes too much time back there. As Zineski and Quinn are there to make sure that he does not get the ball away. And this time, Zineski beat Mr. Karen, who's maybe the best offensive tackle in the Ivy League. Look at number 69 against number 63, all pro against the 210-pound lineman. You don't think that's quickness? He gets right by him. He actually is holding him on that play. Karen grabs him. They should attack 15 on top of it. Great play. Here's Steinberg from the goal line. They're going to block it. And almost blocking it. He goes down, but no flag is thrown. And the ball, the wind blows it out of bounds at about the 38-yard line. So Yale will have it in 
excellent field position. They lead 20 to 14 with 234 to go in this first half as it is cloudy. It is cold. It is windy here at Harvard Stadium. All right, Brantlin Rice against the cold gray sky. One of the things that, that Yale is doing, Dick, and doing very well, they're going to make Mr. Steinberg, as we look at him, number eight on the sideline, think every time he punts that they're going to come after it. And when that gets in the back of your mind, all of a sudden you start to shank it. First down, Yale. At the Harvard 38 yard line. Luzzy out wide on the right. McCauley and Spivak. And McCauley outside. Outside. And he is hit by Cecil Cox, number three, and Ken Tarzi at around the 31 yard line. Really nailed out of bounds. Well, he got great blocking on that side by number 33, Andrew Marwiti, the tight end. Also, Spivak, when he isn't running with the football, has done a great job of blocking. They cut Anderson, number 12, off, and Smith, the adjuster, number 18. He led the block and went outside. Now you have Mike Stewart in at a tailback. He is an end, a quarterback, and now you're seeing him at tailback for Yale, number 18. He gets the pitch, and he can fly. And he slams his shoulder in close to the 25-yard line. Cecil Cox slammed his shoulder in as well. And it's a first down for Yale at the 26 of Harvard. Here's the man, number 18, Mike Stewart, from the tailback position who played quarterback against Penn and almost beat him. He plays every position, as Dick said, and watch him read the block, go to the outside, get around the corner. Great blocking and cutting off the linebackers and the defensive backs. He will play every position, including quarterback. First down, Yale at the 26. Stewart hangs on. This time there's no going. He's stacked up at the line of scrimmage. Danny, Danny Bennett put him away. He sure did. Number 46 for Harvard. One of the other things that uh, Carm Coza thought about doing today, if Mike Curtin got off to a poor start, he was going to insert Mark Stewart in there, number 18, to play quarterback, and particularly in a game like today where the win was a factor. But so far, Curtin has done a terrific job. Second down and 10. Had the pleasure of talking with his parents yesterday afternoon as they watched the freshman game. Stewart, there he is. To throw it. He's going to throw. He's not going to do anything because he's going to be buried back at the 30-yard line. Steve Anderson's there, and so is Brent Wilkinson, number 48, and Casey Smith was there in a hurry. Well, I'll tell you, he had number 10, Mike Luzzi, downfield. Not completely open, but this is called forcing it. This was the halfback option or the tailback option. He sees no opening there. He wants to throw back to the other side, but there are too many people around him. K.C. Smith, Dan Bennett, number 46. They put the pressure on him, but it was designed to throw the football. Hill on third down conversions is four for 10 this afternoon, and they have a third down and 14. From the 30, and there is timeout called on the field by Yale as Curtin wants to go to the sidelines and talk it over with head coach Carm Coach. What they had done is that they had put two tight ends in the game, Quinlan number 14 and 33 Marwitty, to put Quinlan in the slot and put Luzzy outside, and I'm not, I don't, not really sure that he knew that they knew what the play <laughs> was. <laughs> They're talking it over now. Let's get these tight ends straight, guys. Luzzy also, as you have pointed out earlier this year, Luzzy's also an ex-quarterback. Quarterback for two years. Very sound baseball player as well. He went out to California this past summer and worked out with the UCLA players in that area. That they were friends. And down on the sideline, Sean McDonough. Gentlemen, as you can see, we're taking a look at the Ivy League standings in women's volleyball. Princeton wins the Ivy League with a record of 7 and up. But Pennsylvania had the outstanding player in the league. Penn finished second at 6 and 1. And junior Corey Somerstad was the Ivy League MVP. We well, should point out that Cornell, which finished in a tie for third place along with Brown and Yale, all those clubs were 4 and 3. Cornell won the New York State Championship, defeating a very fine Syracuse team. Let's go back to the booth. The a fine Syracuse team. Third down and 14. Yale on the Harvard 30. Ryan White. He's got time, Dick. I'm Ryan White. Mike Curtin looking for a McCauley downfield, and it's broken up. Curtin uh, now three for nine, 56 yards passing this afternoon. We are going to take a look at Ted McCauley, number 26. He plays every position, including wide receiver. He wants to come down and cut in, but Cecil Cox, number three, runs him off his route, and then number 18, K.C. Smith, also gives him a shot, which could be somewhat illegal with the ball in the air. 
Oh, it is fourth down and 14, and now Bill Moore will be attempting a 46-yard field goal attempt. Uh -oh. And this one Piece goes nowhere. It. As it was partially blocked by Ken Tarzi, number 85, who zeroed in on it. Well, the ball goes over to Harvard, and the score remains. Yale 20, Harvard 14, with 57 seconds remaining in this first half. That was a big block because it cuts down on Yale's momentum. It has been all Yale since early in the first quarter, and they have controlled the football, and you can see that Moore is a weapon even with this win. Harvard gets a piece of it that time, but they now must get some semblance of offense going, and I still have a question. I hate to keep repeating it about the quarterback and his, his mobility. All right, Brian White, number seven, quarterbacking the junior from Groban, Massachusetts. And here comes Zaneski. Zaneski out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The man who Coach Carm Perza at Yale is touting for the Ivy League Player of the Year. Really going out campaigning for him. Well, he doesn't need to campaign for him. All he do is take the tape of this uh, game and, and take a look at the job that he has done. He has very rarely been blocked today. Number 69, Brian White is trying to drop straight back. He beats White to the spot. He must have been on the offense. And again, when Brian White drops back, to me it tells me the same thing it did in the Penn game. He does not have the mobility to sprint out and throw. Second down and 19 now for Harvard. Big Nally. And goes down at about the 24. Picks up about three. No, still a lot of yardage to go. Brian White is one for one passing, 35 yards, and that was a touchdown, and that will run down the first half. And at the end of the first half, the score is Yale 20, Harvard 14. And as we pointed out, what makes it so remarkable is the fact that Harvard, the first two times it had its hands on the ball this afternoon in the first quarter, went down and scored. White to McNally on a 35-yard touchdown pass. McNally came back with a three-yard touchdown run. Harvard led 14-0. And Yale got back into the act after punts when kickoffs were bobbled by Harvard. Spivak scored on a four-yard run. Moore hit on a 34-yard field goal. Spivak again on a one-yard run. Moore on a 44-yard field goal. And that's why the score is Yale 20, Harvard 14 at the half. But as anyone will say, Upton, the game is played in two parts. Yes, it is. And again, coming out in the second half, the win will be a factor. But more and more I see of Brian White, my question is, is that knee at halftime going to tighten up a little bit. I think it would have to be. Can Yale continue to take advantage of every break? Probably so. Is the Harvard running game being stopped after the first quarter? Yes. So the momentum going in the locker room is Yale's. If they come out with it, they could steal this game. And back up here in the booth, Dick Alley at an Upton Bell. I might point out, just in case that got by some people, because a lot of people are interested in that soccer score. It was Harvard beating Yale one to nothing in soccer today, and Harvard, of course, is NCAA playoff bound with their soccer team. Well, then bring the soccer team over here to kick for Harvard, because <laughs> they're having trouble with their kicking game as we see that score there, and, and we really have had an exciting first half. Maybe, Dick, the most exciting first half we've had all year long on the Ivy League game of the week, and we're going to take a look at some of the highlights. Well, this is when uh, Brian White and company started it off, Upton, the first time they had the ball. And the only time he had real good protection till the end, and Vignali beats his man deep downfield, number 39, who is the defensive back, Mike Jarkson. He got him one-on-one, -on -one, and that started them off pretty quickly. Now we're going to take a look at Yale's touchdown, and this is Mr. Spivak, who has come in and played a tremendous role for Yale. Number 43 just comes over his center, powers his way, knocks over number 18, K.C. Smith, and takes himself the extra two yards into the end zone. Great run on the short yardage by Paul Spivak. 
And there is your man of the hour and everybody's man of the hour with the way his team's come back, Carm Koza. Tell him to smile, will you please? Well, they're getting ready for the second half kickoff, and Harvard's deep men back there will be Joe Puzatari, number 42, and Rufus Jones, number 31. <clears throat> we look at the crowd, and now we're going to look at Kevin Moriarty. This is one of the few times that Mike Curtin drops straight back and throws over the top. Kevin Moriarty has beaten the corner 85 Tartsy and also number three Cox. Now he weaves his way down the field, finally caught from behind by number 18. Casey Smith here's the touchdown again a short plunge by 43 that man again who stepped in here today Paul Spivak and Yale takes the lead and they've got the lead let's start the second half and here is the kickoff from Moore and it's going to go out of bounds so we'll do it all over again here's an interesting statistic Upton Bell Mark McNally had seven carries for 26 yards and a rushing touchdown in the first half Robert Santiago only carried twice for four yards White had six carries for minus 24 yards and he was one for one passing for a 35-yard touchdown to Vignali. Well, either his knee is bothering him, and we'll watch him again closely as he comes out to see whether they're tightened up at all at halftime, or Yale's defense is doing a great job of cutting off those holes and those cutbacks. And we're going to take a look now. There is the right knee of Brian White. You can see he's padded pretty well. He's jumping up and down on it, but there's a lot of difference between jumping up and down on it and trying to cut on it. And I think that Yale's defense will be looking early to see what he does, especially if he sprints out. You can see heavily padded, heavily taped. And we'll be kicking off in the 35-yard line now. Will be more after the five-yard penalty was assessed. It gets caught in the wind immediately and taken there by Puzatari, and he starts upfield with all the room. And Puzatari gets Harvard excellent field position as he takes it to the 40-yard line. As Andrew Dudley, a linebacker for Yale, made the tackle on the kickoff in this 101st Yale-Harvard football game. Yale has lost to Harvard for the past two years. The last time that Yale won was 1981. That was a 28-0 affair. And then up here at Cambridge, the last time Yale won was an 80. That was 14-0. Harvard first down and 10 at their own 39-yard line. Mark McNally, and he is hit almost behind the line of scrimmage. Getting in there quickly, Yakabuchi. Dean Yakabuchi, 55, and Pat Maloney, 84. Yakabuchi has really played well today in getting into that hole quickly before the running back gets there. We'll take a look at the linebackers. Alakwa, number 40, we're going to take a look at Carmen Alakwa as he gets rid of the blocker and makes the play. Also, 56, Ardell McKenna. Live action, second and ten. Brian White is chased down, gets the ball away, attempts to get it to Savara, but putting the pressure on Yves Labissier, the sophomore who missed most of the year for Yale with a badly separated shoulder, is playing with a shoulder harness that limits his mobility of the arm. And Yale can thank him because he's the man that made the play on the two-yard line last week to stop the Princeton drive and start your friend the Bulldog over there. Look at that guy. They get him in the game. That's handsome Dan saying hello to you, Upton. Well, they started that drive because of his play and won the ball game against Princeton. Third down and 10, and Harvard is 0 for 3 in third down conversions. And they put the no pressure more. on and knocked the ball right out of his hands. Yakabuchi. Yakabuchi picked it up. Of course, you can't advance it. Ball Yale down. will have the ball at the 30-yard line of Harvard. Dean Yakabuchi, number 55, the junior out of Hamburg, New York. He comes clear, completely clear, number 55. This time, White is dropping straight back. He has nobody protecting in front of him. The right guard, you see Yakabuchi comes right inside the center. 59, Jensen makes the play. They are getting pressure. They evidently now know that Brian White is going to have to drop back and pass, which means A that he is having problem with the knee. Hill with the first down. Mike Curtin, the quarterback, puts Luzzi in motion. McCauley. McCauley hit from behind. They're going to be dropped back at around the 27-yard line. Well, Brian they, Bergstrom puts the hit on him. And if Jim Morris, number 87, did not make the uh, saving tackle, he'd have been around that corner for about 10 yards. They can now put the game at their own pace, Dick, realizing what we must know, that Brian White does not have that mobility back there. Second down and seven. Second down and seven for Yale. Line of scrimmage is the 26. And this time, he gets nailed behind the line of scrimmage as Dan Bennett leads the charge for Harvard. 
Number 46. Well, they were watching that the play. Boston. What he does here is he pulls both the guard and the tackle. The handoff is to McCauley with the guard and tackle leading. And this time, Bennett got inside that lead before anybody could get trapped and make the play. Third down and eight now. Line of scrimmage, the 28 of Harvard. Moriarty goes out wide on the right side. Spivak and McCauley in the eye. Here they come. Mike Curtin throwing down for Luzzi. Can't get it. Going downfield with him, step for step, Cecil Cox, number three, but overthrown. Good pursuit. They got good angles on Curtin. He had some time to throw, but Cox really did cover Luzzy very well, but he scrambled out of that, but there was good pressure on him this time. They weren't going to let him get outside. He didn't have enough time to throw. They sent their linebackers, but at the proper angle. Well, it's fourth down and eight, and into the face of that wind, you will not attempt a field goal, so Yale will be going for it on the fourth and eight. At the 28 of Harvard. And a good call. Yale split wide on the right side. And slotted. Big pushing for Moriarty. Big one. Looking for Moriarty. Turns around. Can't get it. And gives a little over the shoulder look and saying, well, Cox bucked me, but the official says no go. No, he so, and actually Moriarty ran into a dick. Oh, like I understand was, that, but yeah. I'm saying he was just trying to yeah. give him a little, you know, give him a little look. Well, he was talking about <laughs> look. Here's Curtin with pressure on him by number 12, Steve Anderson, who makes him throw it up too early. And actually Moriarty couldn't see the ball. Fine defense by Cox, number three, but they are again giving Moriarty too much room to run his patterns. We hope you're enjoying this look back at the 1984 Yale Harvard football game. We'll get you back to Dick Galliet and Upton Bell at the stadium soon. But first, we wanted to take this chance to talk to a guy that's been very busy so far in this football game. And it's all Ivy League kicker Bill Moore. And Bill, when we talked to you for the Dartmouth game, it was business as usual. But in this game so far, special teams have been a big part of the action. Yeah, it was. The guys played great. We, uh, it was very windy that day, um, blowing, uh, I think, right to left. And uh, uh, we ended up um, uh, moving the ball quite well, except we would get, uh, we'd, we'd stop and we ended up trying five field goals. We made three. I think there was another one that was good. I can show you on the film, but uh, officially it was three. Uh, made the extra points, but the, but the critical play, I think, for the special teams was uh, onside recovery. Um, they roughed me on an extra point. Uh, moved it up 15 yards. Coach Coza made a great call and had us uh, had us try an onside kick. Uh, Vinnie Murata held it, and uh, I kicked it. And Bob Dooley uh, ran down, recovered it about 13 yards away from from the kicking point, and uh, uh, we ended up taking it in for another score at that point. And that sort of propelled us over the top of what was a really actually very close game. It's always such an incredible thing to me that when you ask someone about something that happened in their Yale football career, those memories are so sharp. And the camaraderie that you guys have together is so special. Yeah, that's funny you say that. My my parents and uh, and my wife and, and kids have always uh, kind of marveled at, at how much uh, my dad and me and my brother can recall from from way back in the day. And, and my my boys are now one's graduated from college, another one's graduated from high school, and they can do the same thing. They can call, you know, what's the ball? What's the count? What's the balls and strikes? You know, what kind of a, was that off the wall or halfway off the wall? Or did the guy make an error on the play? That sort of a thing. So. Uh, I, I actually had the pleasure of going back to watch the, the um, Yale Harvard game in the, in the uh, Fenway Park and uh, saw a bunch of the guys there and it was exactly like that. It was, uh, I remember this and remember that and, and uh, uh, it's really a lot of fun to do that. Coach Reno talks a lot about Yale being a 40-year decision and not a four-year decision. How has that mentality benefited you once your football career was over? Well, sports was always a very important part of my life, and going to, to Yale and playing for Coach Coza was sort of the culmination of that. You learn, you know, you, what Coach Coza gives you is, is, is you learn how to be excellent, and I, I think that's what you then take into the future, and Yale does that in so many different ways. It does it academically, it does it uh, artistically, it does it with, with music and science, and you, you take um, that understanding and those skills and the resources to move forward in the future. I, I also uh, would say that um, 
one of the interesting things about uh, Yale and the Ivies in general, and, and, and you know, maybe Stanford, the, the Yale of the West Coast, um, is that uh, it, it, all, it, um, opens, it opens all doors. No doors are ever closed if you've gone to Yale because the people will want to talk to you and want to, want to ask you a question. So the 40 years, is, it, ha it culminates in many, many different ways. And I think that that's a great commitment that we were lucky enough to have back in the day. And I'm, I know the kids that are there now are, are feeling the same thing. When you look back at seasons, it is often what happens in week 10 that is the most important. And I've always thought that making the trip up to Boston is the college football experience that is unlike any other. What is it like playing in Boston in a Yale-Harvard game? The year before, we had 73,000 people in the Yale Bowl for the playing, 100th playing of the game, which was, which was really fantastic. I'd never seen the wave before from the field, and it, it was unbelievable standing there watching it happen. Same thing happens at Harvard. We end up with 40, 43,000 people in, in, their, in their horseshoe stadium. And it's just, it, it, the, the, it's so much fun to play in front of that many, that many people, and it, it puts that much more on the rivalry on, and on the win. You know, we were only one in three against Harvard, too, including the freshman year. Uh, we ended up um, um, just a hard fought game and it was uh, it was very, very satisfying to walk away with a victory uh, uh, against against the Crimson there. That was Bill Moore, Yale class of 1985 and special teams hero on this day for the Bulldogs. The second half has been tense so far. Let's go back to the stadium to Dick Galliette and Upton Bell. White has time to throw. Santiago is running a short post pattern. He breaks the tackle by number 39, Mike Jarkson, and it is goodbye. As I said at the top of the show, the only real all the way back in the league. He just runs away from people, but now they're using him where he can really help them. All right, now here's Steinberg attempting to break the tie. And hits the goal post and goes through. It is Harvard 21, Yale 20. Hits the goalpost and goes through. Is that an omen? <laughs> it may be an look, omen. Look at uh, Mr. Robert Santiago winking at us. And he ought to. Uh, it really was a great call at that time when they were not moving anywhere as uh, Santiago was taking uh, congratulations. Now watch this extra point from the end zone. The ball hits the inside of the bar. And watch it ping, ping to the inside of the goalpost. And it's good. That might be an omen. It might be, but that's the kind of series this series is. Anything can happen. Anything usually does happen. And in that case, we're going to get some scores from Sean McDonough. I guess we'll hear about Syracuse again, Dick. Some scores from around the country in the fourth quarter. Boston College has taken the lead over Syracuse, 14 to 10. Florida leads Kentucky, 22 to 17. They're also in the fourth quarter. Navy way out in front of second-ranked South Carolina, 31 to 7. That game is being played in Annapolis there in the third quarter. And Notre Dame out in front of Penn State, 34-7. They're only in the second quarter. At the half, it's Clemson and Maryland tied at 17. Fourth quarter, Ohio State 7 and Michigan 6. Now for the kickoff. Steinberg kicking off the deep men. Luzzy number 10 moving up on the ball for Yale. Takes it at the 15. Cuts. He's got a path. Got a block. Up to the 30 and goes up to the 35 and to the 36-yard line. Well, we've got a flag down, and I believe we've got clipping. Bill Hyland made the tackle. You know, when you have somebody going back and forth and peeling back and trying to get away from tacklers, that's when your people get their head not completely in front of the uh, other person, and we got pushing here, which is interference, and we got 15 yards. Dick, going back to that scoring play, Again, the strategy of football, which is, is most different from any other sport. Joe Rustic was not clearly moving the ball on the ground. His quarterback was limited in his movement. Well, listen to the officials. Use of the hands on the run back. Five yards. His club was clearly limited by his quarterback and the ability not to move the ball on the ground, so he went to one of his new formations, triples right, and he got his back open, and the fastest guy on the field scored. And that's what you want to do. I'll say that again. You know, get that ball in his hands. Number 14. First down, Yale at the 23. Wilkinson in on the tackle and down on the sideline. Sean McDonough with more scores. 
All right, Dick, in the third quarter, Oklahoma State leads Iowa State 13 to 7. Fourth quarter, West Virginia 10, Temple 10. West Virginia really struggling. Virginia supposedly on its way to a bowl game, trailing North Carolina 14 to 3 in the third quarter. Two other games quickly, BYU and Utah tied at 7 in the second quarter. Rutgers leads Colgate 10-7 in the second quarter. Yeah, with a second down and 7 at their own 27. McCauley gets the call, but that interior of Harvard's defensive unit closes down very quickly. Dan Bennett, 46, Jim Morris, 87. Uh, when something isn't working, change. That counter and the pulling the guard and the tackle is no longer working. Harvard has closed it off. Uh, they've got to find something else to do. And, of course, in the third quarter, well, although the flag up on top shows the wind would be at Yale's back this time in the first quarter when they had it this way, it wasn't. Uh, so I don't know if it's swirling that way on the field or not. Third down and six. Line of scrimmage to 27. Sun now poking out. Moriarty's got room. Curtin looking for Murata. No good. Incomplete. At the 38-yard line. And Cecil Cox, number three, covering. He was so close to him, you could almost call interference on that play. He was with him as the ball was coming. I think Murata felt that maybe he was hit ahead of time. He's holding his leg. Now, Curtin throws off balance, trying to hit Murata. You can see Cox on there, and I do believe that that was interference. I do believe that he was holding his arms. And Murata appears to have pulled a muscle in the back of his leg on that dick. Limping off, but he seems to be getting uh, stronger as he gets closer to that sideline. So it's fourth down and six, and Hank Eaton, who averages 39 yards a punt coming into the ball game, will be punting from his own 15-yard line, line of scrimmage to 27. Chuck Shirey back there at around the 33 for Harvard. And I'm sure they told him stay away. Bad snap from center again, and this one goes straight up. No distance, and Harvard players getting away from it, so it doesn't hit any of them. And the ball will be blown dead at the 40, the Harvard 40-yard line. That's where the Crimson will take over with a 21-20 lead. One of the things we saw right there, because a the game could be decided on it, was again almost another mistake. You tell your players to stay away from the football. Number 48, Brent Wilkinson, tried to throw a block on the Yale defender and almost blocked himself into the ball. If he had hit the ball, it was a live ball, and Yale could have recovered. You've got to stay away from the football. All right, Harvard with the lead. Now has a first down at their own 40. They have Coyne out there wide and Sabara in a slot. White always looking there's left. And he hears an Eski, strips him of the ball, but White picks it up. And White is going to take a hit up at the 45 as Maloney gets in there first and Bob Keenan comes in there second. John Zineski, number 69. You want to see a great picture of quickness and speed on the defensive line. Sam Jensen, he's playing on the center. He gets a piece of Jensen to his left and runs right by him like he isn't there. Gets a piece of White who fumbles the football. But imagine having to face this guy going up and down the line. And again, he only weighs 210 pounds. Ryan White has passed only five times, completed three for 105 yards, however, and two touchdowns. It is second and five. McNally up around the 48-yard line. That still be short of the first down. Ardell McKenna, 56, the first to get to him. It'll be about two yards short of the first down. It'll be third and two. To see the strength of the Yale defense, all you have to do is look at 56, McKenna, 40, Alakwa, and 69, Zineski there. One, two, three in tackles. And there he is, and he's breathing heavily, Dick. Did you send him any signals down there? His coach huh? describes him as energy. Uses one word to describe him as a person who never stops. Third down and two, Harvard. McNally in motion. Line of scrimmage to 48. White wants to throw. He's there. Over the middle, wide open. That's Bill McGaugh again. The tight end, and he's to the 25-yard line of Yale. No. Bill McGaugh, the senior from Crestfield, New Jersey. 6'2", 210-pounder. Comes up with another key Harvard first down. Quick drop by Brian White. Quick throw. The tight end is wide open in this defense between or behind the linebackers. And all there is left is one defensive back, and that's number 39, Jarkson, that can bring him down. But they're finding holes now in that Yale defense between the two linebackers, and they're going to take advantage of it until they stop it. Joel Say, number 25 in the Harvard lineup, and he's on White on the right-hand side on this first down of the 25. Screen. They go to Santiago at the 20. And Santiago inside the 20 to the 18-yard line. Carmen Alacqua making the tackle, number 40 for Yale. Is that the first Harvard screen we've seen this year? 
<laughs> it, very close it, to it. Very close to it. Uh, they are beginning to mix their plays very well. They're also finding that Yale's defense is pursuing so aggressively that they're able now to take some of the pressure off by hitting the tight end in the middle of that defense, taking a little bit off by putting the running backs out wide and also screening, in this case, to Santiago. It is working at this present moment. Second down and two now for Harvard at the Yale 17. Big Nally. Close to the first down at the 15-yard line. We'll see where they mark it. John Quinn, 16. Ardell McKenna, 56 in on that stop. Mark McNally, as we said in the previous Harvard, Harvard game, underneath that helmet, a bright shock of red hair. It'll be third down and a yard for the first down. And Harvard has called timeout. And they have that one-point lead. Well, it's a one-point lead, 6.07 on the clock. The win's still a factor as far as they're concerned. Their play has to be the right call. They'd like to get another score now because they probably figure we need a 10 or better pad in the fourth quarter with Yale coming back with the wind against us. Even though it seems to have died down a little bit, at least up here. You've got to get that pad because you, you figure you, your kicker's going to shank some balls. Maybe you get a fumble. They're going to have good field position most of that quarter. You, you'd like to have eight to ten points because that's what will happen. John McDonough has some more information for us. All righty. Field hockey is the subject. Ivy League, women's field hockey, of course. And we can see that Brown and Dartmouth and Penn all checked in at five and one. For Dartmouth, Tony Parrott played in goal all 14 games. She was terrific, terrific had an 85% save percentage and allowed just 19 goals in 14 games overall. Nikki DeMarcus, a junior, was their leading scorer with eight points. Third down and one at the 15. There it is. And Brian White carries. And Brian White scores for Harvard. He runs 15 yards for the score. Brian White. Nothing wrong with his knee on that play. Sure was it. Yale was looking to stop the short yardage. He kept the ball on the keeper. We're going to see it. Ground level. He's going to come down the line. He sees the opening immediately when number 16, John Quinn, steps in. He steps inside of him. Now he jitterbugs his way into the end zone with a little flying dive. And the knee was okay there. Here's another shot of him carrying the football on the left arm, carrying it properly. Watch the move here. A little quickness. Then he dives into the end zone, disdaining the knee injury. And now in the extra point attempt, Steinberg misses it. And so the score is 27-20, Harvard out in front of Yale. Steinberg's had a tough two weeks. He Not really yet. has. Uh, and, and part of it could be that the wind and, and uh, Yale getting in there and getting some penetration, but he just, it seems as when Harvard will take a look at Brian White here, he's got to be a very happy man over on the bench. And uh, he's probably keeping his... We're lead. going to pause just a moment in our coverage of this game between the Crimson and the Bulldogs with the score, Harvard 27, Yale 20. This experience, it lives on our fields and in our classrooms, where every day is a test. Each moment builds on this experience and creates an environment that develops mind, body, and soul. We become part of the storied traditions of the Ivy League. This experience, it is unrivaled. So two left to play in the third quarter. Harvard has gone out in front of Yale, 27 to 20. The extra point attempt was missed by Rob Steinberg. As we see some snow flurries in the air now. Snow flurries is still anybody's game. Seven points. Steinberg will be kicking off the deep men for Yale or Luzzy number 10 and McCauley 26. And it's scooped up at the 20 yard line. Up to the 35. And Eli's Chip Bonney returned turn that. And brought down by Jerry Leone, defensive back for Harvard. Well, one thing that's happened today, none of the deep men that want to return the kickoffs have been able to do it because of what's happened of laying the ball down there. No, Harvard took off three minutes off the clock on their scoring drive, the one that punched them back out in front. Would have had the eight-point margin if not for the missed extra point. 
Mike Curtin, number seven, quarterbacking the Eli attack. Ooh, ooh. And Stewart in the lineup again, Mike Stewart. And he can't find much running room, and he's brought down at about the line of scrimmage. Stewart, as we pointed out, number 18, has played quarterback. He's played wide receiver. He's now playing tailback in this game. And you still might see him as a quarterback. Second down and 10 as there was no gain on the play. Martin Martinson, Marty Martinson, number 51, the center. And Yale captain brings them out of the huddle. Yale has Moriarty wide on the left and Murata in motion to the right side. They try the middle with Spivak and Spivak gets some room and Spivak across midfield into Harvard territory. Finally dragged down by Brent Wilkinson. He gets it down to the 47-yard line and picks up the Yale first down. That's just pure second effort by number 43, Paul Spivak. Sprint draw to Spivak. He comes back over the left side. Watch the spin move as he breaks the tackle. And Wilkinson here finally brought down eight yards after he should have been. Good flood. Yale with a first down at the Harvard 47. Spivak with 58 yards rushing and two touchdowns in the ball game. Stewart gets the call, trying to turn that corner. He'll go out of bounds at around the 40. Pick up about five there. Cecil Cox, number three, drives him out of bounds. Cox, the junior out of Dorchester, Massachusetts, 6'4", 195 pounder. He made a big play there because Spivak had gotten a good piece of Cox. Cox fought off Spivak and still got Stewart as he went around the corner. It'll be second down and six now at the 41. Moriarty out there, one on the left. Yale in the eye. Morata, the wing, comes in motion to the right. Spivak up the middle and tries the second effort and gets them, fumbles the football, and it was blown dead. Blown dead back at the 36-yard line. Well, it'll be Yale's possession. Dave Finikos made the stop on the play. Number Some, 51. Sometimes when you're so intent on breaking a tackle, that's how you lose the football, particularly on a day like today when it is cold. And Yale picks up another first down with that. At the Harvard 36-yard line. 4.35 remaining in the third quarter. It is Harvard out in front, 27 to 20. 52-yard pass play to Santiago. Made it 21-20. Mike Curtin. He's going deep. And what a catch at the 30-yard line by Mike Luzzi, who hung on when he was hit. So, although not a huge gainer, it picked up six yards, but a fine fingertip catch. Brent Wilkinson put a hit on him. Actually, Luzzy was the second man. Luzzy, number 10, watch him jump in the air like a basketball player. He takes a great shot from behind by number 48, Brent Wilkinson. On that play, Luzzy was the secondary receiver. They wanted to go deep to Moriarty, but there was good coverage there. Second down and four, Yale at the Harbor 30. Luzzy has two receptions for 16 yards in the game. This time, Murata in motion to the left side. They give it to McCullough. McCullough, he high steps it to the 20-yard line and another first down. Steve Anderson trips him up, but McCauley picks up the first down. Coming into the ball game today, McCauley had 382 yards rushing. The thing that impresses you about McCauley from the I formation, the tailback, he reads 43's block Spivak and then cuts to the right side. He does a great job of cutting back, reading the block, bumping to the outside. Yeah, with the ball, the Harvard 19. McCauley with 65 yards rushing. Luzzy in motion. Spivak tries to go off his left guard. Matthews. And he's stocked up by Dave Finikos, the middle guard, 51 of Harvard. On that last play, 26 McCauley, I believe, hurt himself. He's holding his side, and I think he was hit pretty hard. And it'd be interesting to see now what happens. Guy stays in the game and gets hit like that. What happens the next time he carries the football? Second down and nine as Eli's come out of the huddle on the 19. The line of scrimmage remained the same. There was no gain in the last play. This time they moved Moriarty over to the right side wide. Harvard with the five-man front. McCauley slices to the 15. Picks up about five. Dan Bennett, 46, met him head on. Yale seems to be able to move the football pretty well on the ground anytime they get inside Harvard's 30. They get fired up when they get in there and they smell that goal line. They're down by seven. Third down conversions this afternoon. Yale has completed four out of 14 attempts. 2-14 remaining in the third quarter. 
Leslie goes out wide on the split side on the right. They're wide on the left as well on this third down and four. Got him open. And he hits Moriarty at the six. That's a first down. It'll be goal to go. First and goal to go. Well, you talk about an outstanding receiver, Kevin Moriarty, number 82. We're going to see him on this replay. Curtin is moving to his left, both backs out in front. He has just a little bit of time to throw on the break. 82 Moriarty, Brian Bergstrom, number 27, is covering him. Again, they are so fearful of this guy, they are giving him a lot of room to run his patterns, particularly to the sideline. All right, first and goal to go at Yale. On the seven-yard line of Harvard, Luzzi comes in motion to the right side. It's speed back up the middle. He turns inside to the four-yard line before Finico and company bring him down. I think he's got to be very careful with that spin move of his when his back is to the defense that he holds that ball in tight or he's going to fumble it. I agree with you. Remember, keep in mind, despite the fact that he has an outstanding game today with two touchdowns, Paul Spivak has not had a lot of varsity experience in carrying the football. It is second down and goal to go from the three-yard line. Spivak tries that middle, but Dennis Vavasis is there, number 74, the defensive tackle for Harvard, to prevent any gain on the play or reaching that end zone. Maybe picked up a very tough yard. They have, they have moved him into the lineup in the second half, and he's 6'2", 235. I think you get a little more strength up front because that's where Penn attacked them, and that's where Yell's attacked them today. They want a little more beef in there, so they've moved him in there. Third down and goal to go. Line of scrimmage, the three-yard line of Harvard. Lovely in motion to the right side. Curtin, they give it to McCauley. He tries to hurdle, but gets nowhere. It gets to about the two-yard line. Everybody was in there. Ball presents a fourth down play. You're down by seven. There are 26 seconds remaining in the third quarter here at Harvard Stadium. Well, here we go. Do you kick the field goal? Do you go for it? I think I got to go for it. I got to agree with you. And I think he will. And I think what he will do is he'll take Mr. Curtin and run him to the wide side of the field with the option to run or throw, sneak the tight end into the end zone. All right. Yale fans are alive. It is fourth down and goal to go from the two yard line of Harvard. No, no, no. Steve Anderson brings him down. They wanted to go cross field again to Marweedy. The tight end on the other they've side. they've used in previous games, but Harvard was ready for it. This might be the biggest play of the game. We'll take a look at it from the ground level. He's got Spivak in front of him. He's rolling, as we said, to the right. He's looking back to his left on a delay to Marweedy, but number 12 reads the play beautifully and makes the tackle. Perfect play by Steve Anderson, number 12. He cannot get out of his grasp. Down he goes, and that might be the biggest play, offensive or defensive, that Harvard has made all day long. I still say that Yale did the right thing I, in going for I'm it. I'm just going to say I agree with you 100%. They did the right play calling, and that is the end of the third quarter. And so at the end of the third quarter, it's Harvard 27, Yale 20, and we have some more information from Sean McDonough. All right, Dick, we're taking a look at the men's soccer standings in the Ivy League. And as the athletic directors mentioned at halftime, Harvard beat Yale this morning. So Harvard's now 5-2. and two. Just update that graphic. And Yale falls to 4-2-1. and one. Columbia, as always, the class of the league, however. They were the runners-up in the NCAA tournament last year. The only Ivy school ever to get that far. And this year, Columbia is ranked sixth in the nation. They're seeded first in the East Regionals and will begin uh, their NCAA championships next week against either Hartwick or Syracuse. For the women, the story in the women's division was Brown. They came out, they started their season with 10 straight shutouts, and they've outscored their opponents 38 to three. We'll st check the women's standings later on. Back to the action. Brings the ball up to the 15 yard line. No gain on the play. Well, now Harvard can afford to maybe try and hold on to the ball a little bit. And uh, Anderson, again, maybe made the biggest play of the game. And Curtin trying to roll to the right and come back to Andy Marwini in the end zone on the left side. Okay, here we go. Second down and 10 now for Harvard as Coyne is on one in that right side. Brian White pitches to Santiago, bobbles the ball. He lost and it. And smothered by white jerseys at the 17-yard line. Yale has recovered the bobble by Santiago Carmen Alacqua. Well, I've always been afraid of handling the ball, and it says this. We're going to take a look at the replay at uh, Robert Santiago, number 14, waiting for the toss on the option from Brian White. Now, he never really gets a hold of the football. It begins to bounce, 
on the artificial turf, it might have been a better bounce, but 40, Alakwa comes up with the ball. My question is, why the toss at that end of the field with the wind against you? So Yale comes up with another break and has a first down at the Harvard 17-yard line as Harvard leads by 7, 27-20. McCauley tries the middle. And tough going there, picks up a couple. It'll be second down and about eight for that first down as their line of scrimmage will be about the 14-yard line. Brent Wilkinson and Dan Bennett the stop. Dick, in, in just, you know, looking at the strategy of the situation, you stop them on a dramatic drive. You get the football back. You want to hold on to the clock a little bit. The win is against you. You really don't want to toss that ball outside. Too many things can happen down there. It's awful cold again. The wind, a big factor. Second down and seven at the 14 of Harvard. Yale trailing. Murata in motion. And Spivak tries that middle. Maybe picks up a yard. Big tough guy, come on. As the going is tough up the middle, Finico's making the stop and Wilkins. There's number 40 saying hello, Dick Galliette, and that's the man who recovered the fumble, Carmen Alacqua. He's a little happy. You know, they might not, they might just settle for the field goal here because there's plenty of time left in this game and they've got the win with them now. Alacqua missed last year with a broken collarbone, started out this year with a broken hand, but played. Third down and five for Yale at the 13 yard line. Yale wide on that right side. They roll. And here comes Anderson again. Moriarty's open, but too far, too far. And do you see the pursuit by number 12, Steve Anderson of oh. Harvard? Just incredible. Chasing uh, Curtin down. He's done a good job for them all year long, but he's had a big day today because it's been his responsibility as we watch Curtin rolling to the right with both backs in front of him. Now, what he's trying to do as we watch number 12, Steve Anderson, chase him is he's trying to hit in the end zone his favorite receiver, 82, Kevin Moriarty, who had run an out pattern. And here we come with the field goal. Moore will be attempting a 30-yard field goal. He has hit 34 and 44 this afternoon, missed 45 and 47. This will be a 30-yard attempt. Gets it up and gets it through. And so the score, as Yale picks up three more points, is Harvard 27, Yale 23. We are going to join our re-air, the 1984 Yale-Harvard football game. Fourth quarter is in full swing as we say hello to our final guest of the day, and it's all Ivy League middle guard John Janeski. And John, we talked about it briefly in our conversation during our Dartmouth game, but after a slow start, the Bulldogs rebounded big time in 84, going 6-1 and one over the final seven games of the season. It was a huge turnaround, especially for my my senior class graduating in 85. You know, we were all freshmen uh, when, you know, John Rogan, Kirk Reeve, Rich Diana, Jeff Rohr were, you know, ranked in NCAA Division One, And we get up there sophomore year and we go to one double A, we go four and six, and we go one and nine. And uh, to finally finish it up, you know, like we did, we can finish up. Uh, six and four, seven and three. Um, you know, winning against Princeton and ultimately against the the dreaded the dreaded Crimson. Um, it's a far better way to end my football career than we were headed going into that season. When you look at this matchup with Harvard, are there any specific memories that really stand out to you from this game? It made the career. We struggled hard for a long time and uh, finished up our senior season with, you know, a winning record, a good performance, beat Princeton, beat Harvard in Cambridge. Um, it, was, it was something special. Moving on from football, the guys who were your teammates that you played with, they, they become part of your family. How have those relationships evolved over the years since football has been over? They're incredibly valuable relationships. I mean, uh, some of these guys I see regularly. I talk with them on a regular basis. And some of the guys you may not see for five years, 10 years, 15 years. And uh, it's amazing to me that, you know, you see them after not having seen them for 15 years and 
you pick up right where you left off. You never miss a beat. Um, you know, uh, a couple summers ago, Tom Giel invited me to his house and he was having coach Sam Co was actually in town and I hadn't seen Sam in 15 years. And, uh, you know, we had dinner, we we're drinking a few beers and laughing and la we just laughed like the last day I saw him when I was, you know, last time I hung out and drank beer with him my senior year in, in, in college. Uh, it just, it's always there. The, the relationship, the history uh, never goes away. John, we thank you very much for your time and your insight into this 1984 Yale Harvard football game. All right. Thank you, Evan. That was John Jadeski, Yale class of 1985, an all Ivy League defensive lineman who has been all over the field today for the Bulldogs. Let's go back to the stadium and Dick Galliet and Upton Bell for the conclusion of Yale and Harvard from 1984. Ten yards. If you want to see why number 69 going against 63, and it looks like he's holding him or trying to bury him, is considered one of the best linemen, defensive linemen in the East, that will tell you why. Second and 18, and Harvard has a triple set on the left-hand side. Pressure. And White gets away, but he's got hanging on him, Yves Lebissier. Number 73, and he'll go down at the 23-yard line. Lebissier, the sophomore out of Flushing, New York. Well, we, that was the same formation that Santiago scored on, but this time, too much pressure by the Yale defense. And when you put all those people out there, there are less people you have inside to defend. Third down conversion come, attempt coming up. Harvard is one for eight this afternoon. They have a third down and 16. At the 24 of their own. It's Santiago and a linebacker. And incomplete. As he was looking for either Santiago or George Sabara, 14 or 40, but it... Hit the turf first, so it'll be fourth down coming up for Harvard. That time, 40 Carmen Alaco, one of the best linebackers, maybe the best. That time he got in front of him and did not let him get position on him. Steinberg will be punting from his 10. The line of scrimmage is the 24. No pressure. McCauley with a fair catch signal, and he settles for that naturally at the 44-yard line. Flannery, whom we mentioned being injured on the kickoff, has a bruised knee, we are told, for Yale. 11.33 remaining in this fourth quarter. And Yale again takes over. Good field position, wind in their favor. They can take their time. There's plenty of time to control the clock. They trail by four, 27 to 23. Harvard defense might have to win this game today. Hill has more reality wide on that left. Fluzzy shifts and in motion from the left side to the right. Spivak, no gain there at the line of scrimmage. He has Jim Morris hanging on him, the defensive right end. Sophomore from Melrose, Massachusetts. 74, also Dennis Vivasis, who has played pretty well since they put him in there, as we said, for the extra beefing up of that defensive line. And I think that's cut off some of the problems they've had although Yale again when they get inside the 30 they can move it. Yale's just put in Tom Juro that's number 25 in at wingback on the second and 11 coming up from the 42. They're coming. And incomplete Moriarty an intended receiver and Brian Bergstrom number 27 covering him. John McDonough. Well, Dick and Upton, I know I speak for all three of us when I pass along our congratulations to Coach Jerry Burnt and his Pennsylvania Quakers. Pennsylvania has defeated Cornell 24 to nothing this afternoon at Ithaca, and they go through the Ivy season unbeaten and win their third straight Ivy League championship. So congratulations to Jerry and his staff. We'll have more scores after this play. Back here at the Cambridge at Harvard Stadium, Yale has a third down and 11 at their own 42, trailing Harvard 27-23. Mike Curtin, Green. out to McCauley. McCauley cuts, and McCauley gets it down to about the 46-yard line, but it's, I think, close to that first down. Peter Mackey wrote him down, and Marty Martinson and Jerry Wozlowski opened up this with good block. This play was set up beautifully from a drop-back position. 
Setting up the screen to the right side over top of the linebackers to McCauley. He's got Moslowski out in front of him. Watch him follow his blocks. First down. First down, it's called at the 45 on Harvard. Morata in motion to the left side. Got time. Curtin looking for Moriarty, but too high. Incomplete. And so, second and ten, Sean McDonough has more for us. We have two other final scores in. Florida has defeated Kentucky 25 to 17, and the Temple Owls on a late field goal beat West Virginia 19 to 17. Other games still in progress. Boston College leads Syracuse 24 16. They are late in the fourth quarter. And it is Navy all over South Carolina, 38 to 15. What a big upset there, there in the fourth quarter. More in a moment. We have a second down and 10 here. Hill wide on both sides at the 45 of Harvard. They try the draw with Spivak. And he's going to get down at the 41, so he'll pick up about four on that play. Casey Smith and Brian Bergstrom driving him out of bounds. And I guess Sean has some more information for us. Elsewhere, hang on to your hat. Notre Dame 44, Penn State 7. They're in the fourth quarter. Third quarter, Maryland 27, Clemson 23. Ohio State is on its way to Pasadena. The Buckeyes out in front of Michigan 21 to 6 in that annual rivalry. Oklahoma State leads Iowa State 13 to 10. And it's West Virginia, excuse me, Virginia 17, North Carolina 14 in the third quarter. And here we have Yale with the third and six at the Harvard 41. Mike Curtin. Uh -oh. Nowhere. He's trying those crossing patterns and trying to get Moriarty where he has a little room to run in the center of the field, but they've done a good job of defensing that. This is the first time that they really stopped Yale in this half and stopped any concerted drive. And so we look at Hank Eaton taking the field for the first time in a while. Yale's punter, number 23. You have Chuck Shirey back there at around the 10 for Harvard. I would move him off the field. <laughs> I would put him so far away from that football. On lazy spiral, fair catch signal floor, but does it make the end zone? No, it does not. And Yale downs the ball on the one yard line. Paul Weimer does that. A 40 yard punt. And so Harvard has its back against the wall with very alert kick coverage down there. Which means if Yale plays good defense, uh, they're going to get the football back probably inside the 50 yard line. It's still with 9.23 left in the game. Weimer from Upper Clare, Upper Montclair, New Jersey, a senior at Yale. No Harvard with a first and go, a first and ten from their own one yard line. They're lined up in the end zone. And the call goes to Bignelli, and he is hit quickly as he picks up maybe a yard. Ardell McKenna was there to meet him head on. Met Steve Penders helped. He met him right in the hole. He almost tackled him in the backfield. 9 0 8, and the clock running in this fourth period. Harvard with a four point lead, 27 23. Early in the first quarter, Harvard had a 14 0 lead. And Yale scored 20 unanswered points. Second down and 10, Harvard. McNally again gets the call and gets out to about the three. Wow. There's a flag on the play. I think if McNally did not step over number 81 or skip over Bob Keenan, he would have been tackled again in the backfield. Blocking below the waist uh, against Harvard. Mistakes, no penalties. Place, no place to penalize him when no. you're on the two anyway. You got a slide rule. You lose the down. Uh -huh. You lose the down and your, your offense has lost any momentum that they, they picked up in the beginning of the second half. And the defense better get ready. Decline. That's Steve Abbott saying he was out further than usual. That's what you have a captain for, right? In the big game. He has a string going for himself. Steve Abbott has never played on a football team that has not won a title, dating back to high school. Well, it just was broken when Penn beat uh, Cornell. Yep. Third down and eight. Or Harvard at their own three yard line. Go throw it. And goes down at the one. Ardell McKenna and or Yakabuchi rather, Dean Yakabuchi, number 55. Boy. Puts him down on the one. 
Do you know what, if he's tackling the end zone, this is where I don't agree with this at all. We'll see the replay. Brian White has some time to throw. He's looking both ways. Great coverage by Yale. And here comes Yves Lavissier, number 73, and he's tackled from the back. And I'll tell you something, they get the, uh, the wait for this kick. Here's Steinberg. Hurries to get it away. McCauley takes it on the run. And is going to go nowhere. He made the fatal mistake of being of stopping Frank Ciotta, defensive back number 44, the first to hit him for Harvard. But Yale will have the ball at the Harvard 45-yard line after that 49-yard punt. Dick, let's get back to play calling and strategy. You're down there, and your man is tackling the end zone. That's two points. It makes it 27 to 25. Yale gets the football, controls it, kicks the field goal, and wins the game. That's right. You're absolutely correct. Good coverage, by the way, just saw on McCauley by uh, the entire Harvard team. But Yale has not been able to move the football in the last few series as Harvard's defense has shut them down. And they have a 27-23 lead, does Harvard, with 7.53 remaining in this football game. Mike Curtin. And he lugs it for about nine yards down to around the 36-yard line. Casey Smith rides him down, and Ken Tarzi also comes up on the play. We've also got for the first time, I think, today, Rick Coe's number 31 into the game. What's that tell you? They're going to try a little power football. Coe's is the junior out of Mayas, Pennsylvania, 6 foot 197 pounder. So you have Spivak 43 and Rick Coe's, the deep back in the eye, on his second and one. And Coe's gets the call and picks up the first down as he gets close to the 31 yard line. You always wonder on that first carry in a cold afternoon. Drop the football. Drop the football. Well, you know what we're seeing. What Yale's plan is once they penetrate inside that 40, they go back to power football. They have now gotten the game in their formation. Two tight ends. They've got number 14. There's Koza looking on. His hands are probably cold, but they're playing with two tight ends, Quinlivan and Marwidi, and they want to go to the power game. First down, Yale at the 30. Spivak gets the call. Spivak gets a little room. And Spivak is driven out of bounds inside the 10-yard line at the 8-yard line. And Spivak driven out by Ken Tarzi, but he moved behind the blocking of Wesolowski and Squara. And we're going to see it right here. Both the guard and the tackle moves. He comes in behind the tackle, number 71, Paul Weimer. I'll watch him come down that sideline looking to try and get as much yardage as possible. The angle on him by number 85, Tarzi, but he makes a great run of it. Yale has a first and goal to go from the seven-yard line of Harvard. They trail 27-23. Coase gets the call. Coase is down to the two. He's gang tackled down at the two-yard line. That's Dan Bennett and Brian Bergstrom riding him down. Maybe closer to the three. Back to, back to their power game. We're told that Ted McCauley is on the sidelines with a bruised knee, number 26 for Yale, but he will be back in the action. He hit it, second down and goal to go from the three-yard line of Harvard. Yale lines up in the eye. They give it to Spivak. He slices and he pushes, but he's going to be stopped at the two-yard line. Anderson and Cox will not budge. The question, the question is, in budging, how much longer can that Harvard defense be on the field and not give up the touchdown? Yale's got to go for the TD. Spivak has 98 yards on 23 carries and two touchdowns. If they don't make it, I don't think they have to, Dick. I'd kick the field goal. It is third down and goal to go for Yale from the three-yard line of Harvard. McCauley hurdles, and McCauley is nope. not in, is not in, is not in. He's at the one. Casey Smith got him right in the air. That was a case of trying to dive too early. You've got to be careful when you do it. To me, I kicked the field goal. There's 5.22 left. You're going to get the ball back again. Here's McCauley diving, I think, too early. He's going to come up over the top with his back leading. Number 18 meets him in the hole. See, helmet to helmet. What a hell of a shot that is. All right, Yale's going to go. Fourth down, goal to goal from the one-yard line. Yale trails 27-23. They line up in the eye. Murata in motion to the right-hand side. They give it to McCauley. He touchdown, touchdown. McCauley hurtled into the end zone, and Yale has gone back out in front. 
Well, that was all on second effort because it did not look like he made it initially. Remember, all you have to do as the fans go crazy, and he does too, is break the plane of the goal line. For a man being injured, he took two leaps in the air, exposed his body, and the second time we're going to see it. From the I formation, Spivak, the lead blocker, meets the man in the hole. He's initially hit in the air again by 18, Casey Smith, but they said he had enough. All right, Yale has gone back out in front, 29-27. Moore will be attempting the extra point. Gets it up and splits the uprights, and Yale has taken a three-point lead, 30-27 to over Harvard, and what a thriller this is. Well, not only that, we're back again in the game of strategy in football, the ultimate of strategy. Now it's three points. If Harvard gets down there on their drive, they're going to be forced now to go for the touchdown if they want to win. There's Tom Cozen, and I'm sure he's aware of it. He's talking to his defensive strategist. Harvard, though, will not have the wind with them. Let us not forget that missed extra point. Yep. That is correct. That was when Harvard went out in front 27 to 20. The missed extra point would have given them, the extra point would have given them an eight point lead, but they had to settle for the seven. Yale, since then, has come back with uh, the field goal of 30 yards and McCauley's three yard hurdle in the air for the go ahead touchdown. And again, the mistakes of your offense, the kicking game, the penalties have really hurt Harvard. And also the decision by Karn Kozer to go for the touchdown. I probably would have kicked the field goal with enough time left to come back with the win in my favor. He went for it, and the guy barely made it with six points. And we still have a long way to go. Four minutes and 56 seconds left to play in this football game from Harvard Stadium. The last game of the season for both of these teams, as it always is. The 101st meeting between these two institutions. Bill Moore booms it. Comes down to Puzzatari at the 5. 10. 15. Ooh -ooh. And just stormed under at the 20. John Shannon down there first, number 28 for Yale on the kick coverage. As the snow flurries continue in a fading sunset over Harvard Stadium. You're going to get that Grant and Rice Award yet. No 450 left. This might be very last Harvard drive of the season. There's the arithmetic. Three minutes and two seconds consumed off the clock. And Yale's go-ahead touchdown. Harvard with plenty left in them, however. That number seven is a magnificent quarterback, Brian White. And he has an equally talented team. First down, Harvard at their own 21. Looking for, and it's incomplete. Almost intercepted back there by Penders. What a shot Brian White took, and that's why he almost had the interception. He really took a shot by number 84 of Yale. Pat Maloney. Pat Maloney gave him a shot. Maloney hurt himself on the play. Watch 84 with a clear shot at White as he's delivering the football. As you can see, the football went over the head of Santiago and almost into the hands of number 40, Carmen Alacqua. Harvard with a second down and 10. On the 21, flag is dropped. Zineski says Maga moved. <laughs> of course, Zineski's so fast, he thinks anybody moves yeah. and moves faster than him. Ryan White, by the way, has put the ball up nine times this afternoon, completed five. And it's Yale this time who has penalized. For 140 yards, White has passing and two touchdowns. We have 444 remaining in the football game. In penalties this afternoon, Harvard has been penalized seven times for 50 Take yards. Offside. Here. Second down and five. Yale four times for 22 yards. It is second down and five for Harvard at the 26. Santiago ooh, ooh, wants to go wide. But Penders, and, or rather Tony Resch, number 49, has him around the ankles as he tries to cut it back. At the 25, so it'll be third down and six for the first down. They're not going to let them outside. You know, making sure if, if Harvard's going to score, they're going to have to throw it, or their backs are going to have to make great cuts to the inside to get the big yardage there. Not going to let them around the corner. 
Well, it is third down and six now for Harvard at their own 25. McNally in motion. White rolls to the left, cuts it back himself, loses the football, fumbles the ball, and Yale is recovered. Yale is recovered at the 31-yard line. Bob Keenan, it looks like number 81. 81, Bob Keenan, that's who it is, gets off the bottom of the pile. And Mr. Ardell McKenna put the hit, number 56. Well, that's a third down call. It's a little surprising. You want your quarterback running the option on third down. And here's the replay of it. He's going to the left. The Santiago is the pitch man, but he decides he's going to cut in behind. His back is into the play. We've talked about that a couple times all day long. When you're running on an angle and you can't see who's hitting you, you're going to lose the football. All right, Mike Curtin has a first down at the 31 of Harvard. And keep it. And he takes it to the 25, picks up about six. Steve Anderson, number 12, rides him down. The defensive end for Harvard. Bill Rustic concerned in turnovers today. Here's the story, Upton. Harvard six, Yale one, all fumbles. All the things that lead to scores are now the clock. A factor, Yale wanting to run as much time off the clock, get field position, and see if they can kick another field goal. Murata in motion to the left side, and Coase gets the call oh. to the 21-yard line. Picks up about four on that. It'll be close to the first down. Cecil Cox, the one who puts the stop around. Harm Coase is running the two tight ends in and out. He's using two tight ends, and he's using Coase and McCauley. And he's running that clock down. And they'll bring him in to measure. He's always used his tight ends. He's always liked his tight ends as messengers. Always has done that since he came to you. Now that's the distance, and you see it, how close it is. It'll be third down, less than a yard for the first down. The line of scrimmage, the 22-yard line of Harvard. 3.18 to play in the football game. Spivak gets the first down and plenty more as he goes inside the 20 to the 18-yard line. You have Wilkinson and Bergstrom riding him to the turf. Spivak and, and uh, Cecil Cox is getting into a little bit, but... It's understandable the defense wants to try and steal the football because the clock is stealing their chance for victory. And a player is down on the field. I believe it's a Yale player shaking up. It might be Spivak, who has played magnificently this afternoon with two touchdowns for the Elias. It's like his right foot, right ankle. They're working on his ankle. No way he's going to come out of this game. <laughs> All those, all that time sitting on the bench was all culminated this afternoon for this young man, number 43. 98 yards rushing on two, on 24 carries and two touchdowns. First down, Yale at the 17 of Harvard as they put Moriarty out wide on the right. Leslie the wing and now goes in motion to the right side. Curtin keeps. Slice is inside the. He 15. dropped the ball. Retained possession, according to the official. Steve Anderson put the hit on it. Line of scrimmage will be the 12. There's Paul Spivak running up and down the sideline. He says everything's okay, Ma. I'm going back in this game. He'd probably like to score and make it three TVs. Why not? You know? you have that kind of a day going for you. One you'll never forget. No matter who you play for in your final game, if you get that kind of an afternoon. Second down and four. A 12-yard line of Harvard. Rick Coase, number 31. He gets close to the 7-yard line, so it's a 5-yard pickup. Brent Wilkinson and Casey Smith are there to make the hit for Harvard. Harm Coase has put in his two original, his fullback and his tailback. He's got Klein and Coase in there. Klein has a big kind of cast on his arm, and they've got a first down, too. Another first down, so it is first and goal to go Yale at the 7-yard line of Harvard. Paul Spivak back in the lineup, number 43 for Yale. Pose in the lineup as well in the backfield. Marwidi out on the right, on the right side. Quinlan on the left side. First and goal to go from the seven. Luzzy in motion. 
They give it to Spivak. And Spivak drives to the one. Touchdown, but there's a flag on the play. He gets to the end zone, but there's a flag on the play. I think they're going to call it on number 54, the left guard, George Matthews. And, uh, brother, this game is not over with yet. A minute and 46 seconds left to play in the football game. Yale has a three-point lead, 30 to 27. Well, the seven-yard touchdown run is called back. It would have been Spivak's third of the game. That also changes what you want to call, although you probably still want to keep the ball on the ground, run that clock down. So take the field goal. Soon we holding on the offense. No score. What do we got? Harvard has two timeouts left in the football game. Yale has their three. It is first down and goal to go from the 11-yard line, so all this still consumes time off the clock. That's what Gale wants to do with the three-point lead. Spivak again. He carries down close to the six-yard line. He picks up five on that carry. And Harvard has called what appears to be timeout. It is timeout called by the Crimson, so they're down to one timeout. One thing, Dick, while we take this time out, I forgot to mention at halftime, we really do want to thank Mark Curran and Carol Carofasco and Ed Markey, of, that's of Yale, and Ed Markey of Harvard and Gil Kerr for putting together really that fine piece at halftime with Bud Collins. Uh, really, all the film and all the tape from the library and people and Gil Kerr put effort. together, it was great. We really want to thank them. Superb effort. Now I want to thank my spotter today, Andy Lynchko, for one magnificent job up here in the booth with us. We have a second down and goal to go as the coaching brain trust on both sides of the field confer with their combatants in the closing minute and 40 of this ball game. Remember that Harvard had a 14 nothing lead early in the first quarter the first two times they touched the ball they went in for scores. Well also they appeared to come back in the second half and take control of the football game again and then uh, the fumble by Santiago, the fumble by White, it just really hurt this club. A 52-yard pass play to Santiago for the touchdown. Early in the third quarter, second down goal to go for Yale from the Harvard 7. Rick Coase inside the 5, down to the 3. Rick Coase the ball carrier. Wilkinson and Bennett ride him down. Coase had 351 yards rushing this season for Yale, two touchdowns. You know, if you added up the five leading rushing backs for Yale, they would still come up 191 yards short rushing between Vignali and Santiago. But the score reads 30 to 27. In this time is running out. In this, the final game of the season. As Joe Rustic said yesterday, he calls this game the beginning of a new season, the Yale Harvard game. Timeouts left. Harvard is out of them. Yale has their full complement. Harvard called a timeout, and uh, that's right. They are out of them now. Now you can essentially sit on the football. I mean, you can score. I, you know, I, I might really take my time. I don't know what I want to score right away. I'm going to tell my quarterback to run around for a while because I don't want Harvard to have the football back anyway, even if you think it's out of reach. A line of scrimmage is the two-yard line. It is third down and goal to go for Yale from the Harvard two. The score is Yale 30, Harvard 27 with a minute 24 seconds left to play before the sellout crowd here at Harvard Stadium. The airlines up in the split backfield with Spivak and Coase. And Spivak well, gets the call but gets nowhere. I believe he might have gotten back to the line of scrimmage and certainly not much more. So that brings up a fourth down. Now what do you do? Well... Huh? I think I got to go for it. Well, you want to go for yeah, it. You, you want know, the clock to, to run out. Keep running. You're not going to get all the time run off. If you don't make it, Harvard has got about uh, 40, 30 seconds to see if they can come down and tie the football game up. So just, you know, you think about it. Do you kick the field goal 
which makes them have to score a touchdown. And you go to the touchdown, if you miss it, they can they can tie the game with a field goal. 45 seconds on the clock running down. Fourth down goal to go from the two. They give it to McCauley. Nope. There, no way. Didn't he, make it. They didn't let him leap that time because Mackey went right for his legs. All right, they have no timeouts. Remember, the clock only stops, Dick, when they get the first down. So what Harvard did paid off. Hey, it's easy for me to say it. I'd, I'd have kicked the field goal and make, make them do it. But they feel that the clock has run out. They've only got 39 seconds to do it. But you've seen crazier things happen with this uh -huh. series than I have. Now, well, anybody who ever sat through that tie here in 68 will believe in anything in a football game. You have 39 seconds left to play in this football game, and Harvard has the ball on their own two-yard line. And they're going to have to throw the sidelines. And White fires for that sideline to toss. The coin is brought down at the 15-yard line. That'll stop the clock because it is a first down. Dooley made the tackle. Bob Dooley. It stops the clock, and he almost was able to toss to McNally, which they're going to look for. They're going to pass to the sideline and look for a back to come along as a trailer. Or a burner like Santiago. First down at the 16. They go to the sideline. There's Santiago. He's going to run it out of bounds. So that stops the clock at 26 seconds at the 16-yard line. We probably have had more strategy in this game today go back and forth than in most football games you'll see in a full season. You might be right, Upton. They say it went out at the 14-yard line. So it is second down and 12. As there was no gain on that, a loss actually of two yards. Line of scrimmage, the 14-yard line of Harvard. Harvard, of course, is split on both sides. And going down deep, and Jarkson kicks it off. That's it. And Jarkson takes it down to the 10-yard line with 14 seconds on the clock. Left to play. And out come the white handkerchiefs. And they're all from the Yale side, too. And of course, it's a great Joe Rustic as we look at him. It's got to be a terrible disappointment for him. Maybe one of the great upsets for Carm Cosa. His season and, and culminating in this game, assuming the clock will run out with 14 seconds. All they have to do is sit on the football. They do not have to call another play after this. In a game that saw Harvard with seven turnovers, and Yale won. All right. Yale with the ball, just running it out now. And that should do it as the clock runs down eight seconds, seven. And Yale has capped a magnificent season, ending it six and three by beating Harvard this afternoon, 30 to 27. Everybody in the stands is happy. The Yale players, Mike Perkin, is certainly happy. This is the greatest way for him to go out. But I think the man that will never forget this day is number 43, Paul Spivak, a guy who was seldom used the last week. And we want to take a look at Carmen Cozer. Dick, you've known him for a long time. You look at this reaction. He takes his headset off, puts it down, begins to hug. It looks to me he's like crying. he's got tears in his eyes. This has to cap his greatest comeback in his career, his greatest season and in the game. A lot of people thought that Harvard would dominate. Everything went right. Everything that he did went right. The only thing that you can look at at the end is how it is. And we got well, we have the happy man down on the sideline with, Cook, uh, with uh, Sean McDonough. You're absolutely right, Dick. Time Coach is very happy. Dick Elliott, your good friend, said at the beginning of our telecast that you kind of relish the role of coming in here to Harvard Stadium as the underdog. And if your team didn't play like an underdog, they've been a very gutty performance against this Harvard team. Through the years, you never want to come into this game as a favorite. It seems like the underdog does the unexpected. And, and if we were the underdog, we did the unexpected. But I'll tell you, our kids all year long have come from behind to win. This is the fourth time. Not quite as sensational as we did last week, but I'll tell you, they're great, and I'm so happy for these 31 seniors. I think, Carm, a key to the game was when you went down 14 to nothing, your team never lost its voice. A lot of courage. There's a lot of character on this team. They endured two tough years, and they know what it was like to be behind. And I'll tell you, they're great competitors, and I'm really proud of them. 
some of your personnel. I know you touted John Zaneski as a potential Ivy League player of the year. In your opinion, did he do anything to hurt his chances of that today? Not in my opinion. He did a, he's a great football player. He's a great competitor. You know, he's so hard to block, and he helps the rest of our defense because they have to double-team him doing an awful lot of things to keep him out of the backfield. This is a great game, and you've been around so many great Harvard-Yale games in the past. Where does this one fit in is this, uh, as far as the great games uh, go? This comes up to the top, especially because we won it. <laughs> well, let me ask you one other quick question. You've won so many games from uh, come from behind fashion. Were you at all concerned when Harvard got the ball back with that great backfield that they have and all those explosive weapons that they may be able to pull a come from behind victory off against you? You're every, it, it always can happen, and I warned our people when they were excited before that. I said, this game is not over, and it wasn't over, like Yogi says, until it's over, and that's the way it ended. Carm, I know after a 1-9 season last year, that's going to make this even so much sweeter. You bet it does. Super. I'm really happy. Thank you. On behalf of myself, Upton Bell, and Dick Elliott, congratulations. Thank you very Great much. for your Thank time. You. Let's go back to the booth. Well, back up here in the booth, and there you see the final score. But the young man, Paul Spivak, had 103 yards rushing for Yale and two touchdowns. That'll be the story of this football game. And Curtin directed them magnificently, but the Yale defense will get all the plaudits as well. They earned every bit of them capturing those seven turnovers. Well, we have the Dick Galliette Car of the Game Award. I guess you'll <laughs> be giving it to Spivak, and it certainly deserves it. I would have to say that, that not only was it a tremendous season and enjoyable working with you and Sean, but also this was one of the most exciting football games mistakes are none I think I've ever seen how could we ever cap you can't you can't cap a season better than this Sean McDonough down on the sideline all right Mike Curtin congratulations first of all when you're down 14 nothing were you guys at all concerned about your ability to come well, back I don't think so you know we came back at Penn not quite enough unfortunately and we've been coming back all season I think we had our backs to the wall, but we certainly weren't counting ourselves out. I think that was pretty obvious. All right, Mike, we got to run real quick. We had John Zineski here. John, you played a terrific game. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Let's go back to the booth. All right, and there you have it, the wrap-up of this football game. And so we could go on endlessly with thank yous, Upton Bell. And this is the first season of Ivy League Football Game of the Week telecast. And a superb pleasure for me to be able to work with you and in on these telecasts. And we certainly have enjoyed every moment of it. And so from Harvard Stadium, where Yale has defeated Harvard 30-27, to this is Dick Galliard for Upton Bell and Sean McDonough wishing all of you a very pleasant good day.